Federal Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda Together. My name is Hez Kimomi Alinda. I'm the Executive Director at Uganda Free Zones Authority, commonly referred to as UFZA or UFUZA. Uganda Free Zones Authority is a government agency established for the purpose of creating opportunities for export-oriented investment and job creation. A free zone is a gazetted geographical area where processing and manufacturing of goods is done with exemptions from import and export levies and taxes to make goods competitive on the global market. This facilitates trading for development in the age of global value chains. With 27 free zone licenses, uh, these are both developers uh, and operators, and one public free zone under construction at Entebbe International Airport, and four more planned across the country, we are looking forward to expanding our capacity as a country to export and integrate more in the global export trade. Join us this Wednesday on URA TV's show, Show Me the Money, to participate and benefit from the opportunities in free zones in Uganda as we continue to create opportunities for export-oriented investment for God and my country. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda Together. In chess, the small one can become the big one. It's the same here. And here too. Watch every move. Record every number so you can plan better. No matter the size of your dream, tomorrow's success belongs to those who keep today's records clean. File your returns today. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The taxpayers' appreciation season is here. We recognize, celebrate, and award Uganda's top taxpayers. Be part of the online Bombaya Business Summits and stand the chance to win smartphones, gift sets, hampers, and lots more. Visit our social media pages to find out more. We appreciate you for paying your taxes. We're proud to be Uganda. Uganda Revenue Authority, developing Uganda together. Oh, wait, Tabu, Tuna Marilisa. And what are you doing throwing papers all over the place? I'm looking for an invoice for a sound system and cables that I received yesterday, but I can't find it. You know there is a way of keeping all this in one place and available to you as and when you need it. I really wish there was one. Because the way these invoices grow legs and disappear. I believe this is what you're looking for. Eh, eh? Now how did it get there? Tabo! Do you know that with Efris you can stay on track of all your business transactions and improve on your record keeping? How so? Katituliku computer with Efris. I just search using the fiscal document number and I retrieve the records I'm looking for. Bookkeeping becomes simple after that. Kapo, also me. And now I'm in charge of my business. You can as well. Kakasa, be sure you are in charge of your business. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together.
Francis my name is Street Alert is the show guess what ndi kwaluwa pake sawa zinongera nze kumanya abasubuzi bayo chiche bamanyi ku tini namba tini namba bamanyi tini namba bamanyi okola mugasochi e ina mugasochi bani abazigaba so tujoini ngeko nga tugenda ku Street Alert ngira tugenda abatukola interview yafe ku bantu benyini omu 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 abasubuza benja olona abantu benyini abakolele emili mu kino omu batubulire tini namba bazimanyi chiche bamanyi ku yola e ye banange ngoberera nga tugenda maso Jaga laku manya tini chichi. Tini nambe chichi nubazi zeba chitu yingiza mwane. Yate chuchitia. Kati tini nambe yo kubagireke lomo solo wibatu gamba. Tini ya ina mga soji. Tini ya yamba government. Tini ya yamba government. Zete nyamba. Tini ya yamba government. Zete nyamba. Tini chichi. Tini. Pozi nga o. Tini nambo jimanyi. Tini namba, si manyi tini namba, chiku mwumu mbuza tini namba. Mwumu manyi zaabi kabi umeka? Minji. Minji. Aha, mpa mpebi kabi umanyi. Tini namba, chisi nzira, kwa wali nzo kubango, genda nga kumoba yoro mwane, nima kubuza. Pini kodi. Nzo kubango, genda nga kumoba yoro mwane, nima kubuza. Minji, nima kubuza. Nga pini, pini kodi, like, like that. Nga zi pini kodi, like that. Tini, tini oji manyi? Tini oji manyi. Ah, tini, tini ya ina muga soji. Tini wa muga so guwayo ya yambo kusasuri ya kemi soro. Na hivi lala. Tini nambo jimani. Eee jimani. Usubi ya tini nambo ina muga so. Eee ina muga so kuyamba kurujestari inga nukumo natari inga business yogo ya kola. Amanya. Amanya mtaru tali marobati. Mtali marobati. Wanokola umu limuchi wana. Tali romani. Mubai romani. Eee. Tini ochimani. Yes. Tini chitegeza aji. Kari evera enamba evuwa muri yara e. Yosura kama yosura suru musuru. Kwa nange nipo musuru. Tini nambo ochimani. Tini namba, nchimanyi kubanji ina. Kubani neduka wa nekapato inza. Kubani naduka notaba na tini namba. Kusu ya tini namba ina muga sochi? Tini namba batu gamba. Sometimes wabote ambudeko, ewelu. Obala okukakasanti oli mutu uze, elo wamu solo to the country. Ino kubani tini namba. Ngo omu. Tini namba ojimanyi? Eh, tini namba nchimanyi. Tini namba ina muga sochi? Tini namba yamba kongo, ya galosa sulo ya misolo. Like you are a A. Oya galoku oku chuo oku funa number plate yeye moloka mita kisa tini number oya galoku na driving license mita kisa tini number yeye sasa tini tini njimani tini ni namba kasi walu walu tini achikewe tini ni namba tini ni namba tini ni namba ah tini njimani kare ah ovari koko na isi nchuo sasa sulo msolo gobrunji nti kwa kuziwa zambi kwenye msolo wengine Ndiyo kwa kumanya, tini chechi. Tini, tini namba. Kwa nsa suri do musoro, ne chechi dati. Kwa subi ya zina muga sochi tini namba hizo? Tini namba, zino zanga identification, uwa identifying la umu mtu, uwa yu aina business, uwa yu na chako. Tini namba o chimanyi? Tini namba o chimanyi? Chitegeza. Tini namba chitegeza. Bobo ina tini namba katugambe oguze motoka. Otumize motoka. Kati bobo genda kusasula murevenyu. Oina kubo ina tini namba kugamba. Sobo ya kubo ya nanomu manyago. Jesu ya tini namba tujize ya tumanyo mga sogu hayo. Ataji manya yogede vyo na vyo yogede. Ok. Kanupune asa ya tufo kufo wawa kugu. Tini namba. Nemi gaso ya tini namba. Tawela vila bro hasa. A boy from Chivoga has been my name. Comedy Treats is where I come from. Don't forget. You can check where you are for more funny clips. And again, Balix. Bewa bade kuche kateka yoku wanga. Tine chitu chikutu kako. Oneje tutamulide bane mkulike yo bigger pond. Faizo on camera. And Faizo my main producer. Wena yu kwa saganyiza. Bane. Noza tunadamu mwela ba. Tini ye namba yu msole kwa ula kumi uo msole umulala. Elange nabe ene sovolo kuwe wangu uo mtu sa chinomu. Ndi video. Oba nge chitongole katugezo inaka business kakari ya yu. Oli nge chitongole chokole damu kwe gamba. Tujiwa uo mtu sa chinomu. No mtu atali sa chinomu. Ele nabe ene vela namba nga ya digiti kumi. Ugeza nga 1,023,37. Kwe gamba vela ke namba kumi. Elange nambe ne kwa ula kumui uomu solo omulala. Ata chila mtu ya njaka doku manya. Nti eku ya mbetia. Tin, te yamba government yoka yoka kukunganya musolo okuvamu bantu. Obebi tongole. Wabula na wengu uomu mtu eku ya mba okugeza. Eku ya mba ko okusasulu uomu solo echonchoge de. Eku ya mba ko nga osubule bintu. 
okuvebwe lwe gwanga atena okubitunde bwe lwe gwanga okusobola okubikiri yalinga ne bibelanga bisasulo omusolo ono kubanga oli na team echirala ekuyamba ko obo bango sabatenda mu government kubanga wali wa bamu kufe ababelanga twagala okolera government emirimu ekuwadda akalimu baweta ago kuberanga oli na team lwansonga ti omuntu government gwe okolera emirimu be bitongo le bidale byenjawulo biku sabo kubera ne chetuita tax clearance certificate ekukaka santi gwe wa wandi siwele misolo jo jisasula bulunji so tini ya kuyamba kumu nkole yo echi lalo kuchuso wa nanyini kubiduka wali uoba na fabatunde motoka zaabwe mabazi guza abantu wabalala chizibu nyo kuchuse motoka yensanji zinonga toli nachi tini kubango yingira mwa mutini yo mwenyini nyini na ojiteka mwenye otika mwenye password yo mwango sobolo kuchuse motoke yo kwe motoka katuazi chusa za wandisi wa kusistimu sibi ebili ebili eda ngoline chipapo la chebali Nobe nango chichu sana uchize omu ntuwa mulala. So teen ya mga sonyo. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda Together. Our humble beginning take place in September 1991 with an amalgamation of three different departments in the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. Back then, the economy was just getting back onto its feet. Tax collection stood at 6.83% of the GDP, amounting to 180 billion Uganda shillings in the financial year 1991-1992. The URA senior management team, comprised of over 60% expatriate staff, and revenue collection depended majorly on cash-based systems. Dennis Rahel, please be in class. Okay, so once again, I would like to welcome you to this session. We are going to start in a few, and uh, we'll have uh, Frank take us through the next two hours. And today we are going to discuss investing in real estate, what you must know. Our panelists have kept time. They're already in their house. We'd like to take this opportunity to appreciate them for keeping time, but also for accepting to come and share knowledge and wisdom in this very important uh, topic. If you're in here and you would like to appreciate this, please join your hands and clap for these people. They have invested in time. Let's appreciate them. Thank you. And thank you, our dear panelists, our esteemed panelists. We respect your uh, gracious time that you've come to share knowledge with the Ugandans. We're going to air this live, but also we're going to have a repeat of this on NBS from uh, midday on Tuesday up to 1 p.m. And we also have uh, this session repeated today at 2 p.m. on UBC and uh, on other live platforms that we'll be having uh, thereafter. So we we'll allow you to, we, we shall, we shall uh, ask you that we use your content hereafter so many times on different platforms just to make sure that we educate more Ugandans. So we are going to be live now. One, two, three, Frank. Good morning. I welcome you to episode two of E Bomba Ya Business. We're coming to you live from Sendaula Hall at Nakawa in Kampala, right here at the Uganda Revenue Authority head office. Thank you for joining us. Those who are watching us live uh, on uh, BBS, uh, you're watching us live on Baba TV, URA TV, Facebook, and uh, YouTube. We're on Twitter space, we are live there, and hashtag is uh, URA Bombaya Business 2020, uh, 2021. I welcome you once again. This is day two. It is uh, a very special day. It is very exciting. We had uh, this, um, the same meeting, uh, a meeting of a similar nature last week when we opened uh, the summit and it was exciting as well. We're going to be having these sessions for five weeks up to the 12th of November. Like I've told you, today is uh, 
very, very special uh, with an interesting topic about investing in real estate, what you must know and do. Friends, the COVID pandemic has affected business across the globe, there is no doubt, and real estate has not been an exception at all. There has been a reduction in transactions. In some quarters, construction was disrupted, and there is uncertainty in the sector as we speak. So today, we come to learn what are the new opportunities in the sector? What are the losses? What are the gains? What should you do before you invest in this sector? And the stakeholders already that are in the sector. Uh, what is it that you must do to keep strong, to stay afloat? Those are some of the tips the panelists today are going to share with us. And I must remind you that uh, in this uh, session, you should expect, of course, a lot of information, but you can send in your question, you can send in your thought. A line where you can uh, send that will be shared very shortly. I welcome you once again. There are partners who are working with uh, URA on this and associations that have been represented today. Kampala City Traders Association, Casita, Association of Real Estate Agency, uh, Kampala Arcades Advocacy Forum, uh, Siatin, uh, Municipal Development Forum, University Tax Societies. These sessions have been represented and we thank you for taking this uh, seriously and making sure that you be a part of it. My name is Frank Walisimbi. We have a panel that um, the panel today comprises people with uh, a great wealth of knowledge and experience in the sector of real estate. And I will in introduce them uh, one by one. I will start with uh, Miss Irene Mbabazi. Irene Mbabazi is the Assistant Commissioner, Research and Innovation at Uganda Revenue Authority. She's a seasoned tax administrator who, is, who has uh, served at URA for over 20 years. Uh, and one of the people that have successfully transitioned URA from a manual space to an e-environment space. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, Ms. Judy Rugasira. Thank you for joining us as well. She's the managing director, Knight Frank. Uh, she's a chartered surveyor and a property professional with over 25 years of experience. Dr. Sudil Rupareyo. Many of you are familiar with this name. Dr. Sudil is the founder and chairman of the Rupareyo Group with huge investments in financial services, real estate, education, hospitality, agriculture, media, among others. Uh, Dr. Sudil is a self-made billionaire entrepreneur with a, a great wealth of real estate knowledge as he is the chairman of Mera Investments, a property development arm of the Rupareyo Group and the largest developer of commercial and residential space in Uganda. Welcome, Doctor. All right, and uh, Miss Shelley Kongai. Good to see you. Shelley is a lawyer and senior partner of Kongai and Company Advocates. She's the chairperson of the construction and real estate sector and a private sector foundation, and also the president of the Association of Real Estate Agents in Uganda. That is a professional body. Good to see you. All right. Shelley, I, I will start with you. I will start with you. You will open up our uh, meeting today. And I am asking, Shelley, real estate in Uganda, where are we right now amidst the, co the COVID pandemic that we're grappling with? It has basically affected every business on the globe. So where are we? The losses and gains in this sector. We can start from there, Shelley. Thank you very much, Frank. I would like to start with the real estate as a whole. Uh, it is both professional, it, it has a combination of uh, both informal and informal players in the business. Yes. It is highly, uh, it is unregulated. The developers are doing their business, the brokers are doing their things, the managers are doing their things. Uh, we are unregulated, basically, largely. There are some laws, but uh, we are not licensed as brokers, so it is mostly led by the private sector. The government is not so involved into real estate. It is majorly private sector led. 
So I will go to the situation as it is now. Um, real estate movement follows the economy. Uh, at the moment, we see there's a lot of pressure in the economy. Uh, the GDP has gone down, and so even the real estate activities are also under pressure, just like the rest of the economy is. When we see uh, a lot of economic activities going on, then the real estate uh, sector also gets the multiplier effect and also thrives. So at the moment, uh, it is under pressure. It is not moving so well, but uh, there is hope. After the lifting of the lockdown, surely business is starting to pick up everywhere, and the real estate business is also picking up. Um, I could say that uh, there is a lot of activity in the residential uh, part of real estate, uh, especially the mid, mid end to low end. Uh, there is high demand. Uh, there's uh, a lot of supply for the high-end pro pro properties or products. Uh, when it comes to uh, the commercial side, uh, we are seeing people relocating from, from the CBD to the suburbs. Uh, there's a lot of empty spaces. Uh, we are seeing the, the developers becoming more innovative. They are trying to lower the rent, they are negotiating with, with, with their tenants, they are giving uh, incentives to the, to the tenants, and uh, yeah, it is slowly picking up. People are relocating. Tenants are relocating, you're saying, or, or to, to, to the outskirts of, of the city. Okay, the effect of COVID, yes. because uh, the consumption power is is stressed at the moment, and so people are opting for cheaper options. So we, sh we, we see most of these uh, small businesses moving from the city center to the suburbs. We are seeing people moving, uh, getting innovative, and doing their businesses online. We see a lot of online markets coming on. If you see uh, the traders, most of them are now trading online. We are seeing people have reduced spaces, because of the pressure of, of the pandemic. And so uh, people are looking for cheaper, uh, affordable uh, spaces where they can do their businesses here. That therefore means that there is a gain on the outskirts and there is a loss in the CBD. Yes, yes. And people are also looking at uh, using their home areas for offices as well. Yeah, people are getting more innovative. And we are seeing the, the, the developers at the moment are also starting to furnish. They are, they are changing with the trends. They are starting to furnish. We are seeing furnished commercial areas uh, coming up now, offices. Uh, and people are starting to lease uh, spaces. People are starting to, to own those small spaces like in condominium as opposed to how it was before. Do, do the consumers of the products these people are selling, are, are, are they aware of this trend. If I found a person A at a certain arcade in Kampala, is there information? How, how do they get to know the consumers so of this the, product? The, the real estate, there is a move. Um, there's a lot of speculation at the moment. Information is individual. Information is not centralized. So yes. yeah, as, as, as we carry out, from our experiences, we, we get the information, but we don't have that uh, specific place where or we, we don't disseminate information as such, yeah. How are real estate uh, developers and the investors generally in this sector, how are they coping with the credit they, they, they took from the banks? I understand that the fall of uh, 2019, uh, banks issued out about over three trillion shillings in credit to, to real estate developers. Isn't that a worry? How are they dealing with it? Have you engaged with the banks? So most uh, developers or most people who have gotten mortgages from the bank now, we are seeing them negotiating for restructuring of their credits. Uh, payment has been a challenge. We are seeing people who are losing their properties uh, as a result of failure to pay or to, to meet their financial obligations. But uh, some are negotiating for uh, longer or better payment uh, opportunities.
I hear you. And how about um, uh, the, the, the issue of the uncertainty generally as, as the association? Have you talked to the developers, the, the stakeholders about this uncertainty? Is there a central source of uh, information, you know, to, to tell them about the foreseeable future, the prospects? Yes, we have tried to engage uh, the real estate practitioners as a whole. We have tried to engage them and, and talk about the changing trends. We are encouraging people to now change with the times and diversify probably their portfolios. We are encouraging them to be now tech savvy and not uh, stick to the old uh, ways of doing business. For example, the brokers now are changing their ways of uh, doing their businesses. We are now seeing people touring properties virtually. They don't have to go there individually because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we, are, we are seeing people providing, the developers also providing that virtual tour so that people can use uh, virtual reality to see, what is the, to, to, to see their properties. So basically we are changing with the trends and those who will uh, change and um, embrace the, the current trends, of course, will thrive. So we are talking to, to them. Lastly, Shelley, of course, I'll come back to you, but uh, uh, there is the element of uh, taxation. How is it affecting the sector as we speak now? I understand it declined a bit. Uh, collection declined on the side of URA by about 4.6% in the first quarter of 2021. But how is it affecting you generally? Of course, the higher the taxes, the more expensive the properties, and it becomes unaffordable, and the more uh, difficult for it to, to move. I was speaking to Madame Irene just as we were coming in, and I was telling her that uh, we need to widen the tax base of the, in the real estate sector. If we regulate the sector and bring on board the agents, then we will reduce the pressure that we are giving the developers the moment because we are taxing just a small uh, a small section of the real estate and the rest are going untaxed yeah because they are informal so if we look at our tax policies our our laws and policies and widen the tax base regulate the sector and promote uh, formalization of our businesses then the taxes will be wider and maybe we will not be stressed with uh, this whole idea of uh, taxing just a small uh, group of real estate players. Thank you, Shelley. If you're just joining us, you're watching the second episode of uh, e Bomb by a Business. We're coming to you live from Sendaola Hall at Nakawa, uh, the URA headquarters. On sign language, we have uh, Olivia Nachigozi Bulega. She's on the sign language. You can join the conversation on Twitter. You can use hashtag URA Bombay Business 2021 on Twitter Spaces. We're live as well. Uh, Judy Rugasira, I come to you with a question about land. Land is, in fact, the, the first component that you talk about before the, the conversation about real estate even grows bigger. Land is the first thing that, that you have to talk about. And it constitutes, of course, uh, the, the conversation. But at the time, what should I consider before I make a decision to acquire land? And aside from that, how does our land tenure uh, system favor or disfavor land ownership? Thank you very much, Frank. Um, first of all, the land tenure systems, there's the different types of land tenure systems, customary land, freehold land, milo, um, and leasehold. So it really depends on what tenure of land you are look, looking at or you have or are interested in buying. Um, obviously, before you go into any investment, any property development, it is prudent for you to do your due diligence, okay? Um, and there are different phases of you know, acquiring land and moving on to property development. The first phase is, is the pre-purchase stage where you identify the land that you want, um, find out or do your due diligence about where it is, how much it is, what tenure it is, who owns it, ownership and things like that. So before you get involved in any development, it's important to understand the tenure, okay, to understand what the restrictions are on that land, 
to understand how many years are left on that lease, if it's a leasehold, for example, um, if there are any easements, okay, if there are any restrictions, height restrictions, is it a wetland, um, uh, do, do you need to fulfill certain planning requirements before you actually build on it? So it's critical, and some of these might vary with the different tenures that you have, okay, um, and others will have less or fewer restrictions on them. So depending on which tenure you're holding as title, you need to make sure that you do your due diligence to ascertain what exactly you can build on that particular plot of land. You need to do your due diligence, you need to get your ownership details um, sorted out, go to the lands registry, do a search on that property, make sure the ownership is regular, okay? You've heard of you know, different situations where you have two or three owners on the same title, for example. So we really need, I would advise any developer out there that as you're picking the land that you want to purchase or that you want to develop, you've got to invest time and, and a bit of money doing your due diligence to ascertain ownership, to ascertain what you can and cannot do on that plot of land. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. There are cases when uh, people just dive into the sector without, uh, you know, taking into note, uh, for example, the tips you're sharing. Mm. We, we want to make this um, a, a meeting, a discussion. Uh, we want to make it a, a one with uh, user information, mm. you know, uh, A, B, C, D, what am I supposed to do uh, here and there. So as the industry as it is now, the, the sector, what advice would you give uh, to somebody who has money, but they don't know the price of, uh, say, the, the, the things they need to construct, uh, they don't know about uh, the tax regime, how it is working, and that kind of thing? What, what, do you have a source of information where you can refer this person? How can they do it? Okay, um, I'll reverse the question and, and tip it on his head. When, because we're talking about property development, and I'm going to focus mainly on residential property development, okay? Um, for, for someone who's starting out, because um, this advice wouldn't apply to uh, Dr. Rafaeli on my right, because he's, he's a seasoned developer. But for those who are starting out in development, what is it all about? Basically, property development is adding value to land or buildings, okay? You're creating value okay, by adding onto either land by developing it or a building. You can renovate it, you can convert it, that's a way of adding value. Okay, and at the end of the day what you're trying to do is to make sure that you create that value and make the development profitable so that eventually you can sell it. So I think the question is how do we develop properties that are profitable and we're able to sell them without making a loss? Because for a lot of developers out there, I mean, they might have to borrow money. And even if you're building on equity with your own cash, you don't want to lose that money. So you really want to build something that is going to be profitable and you're going to get a return out of it. Now, is there any information? There isn't a central place where you can go and collect all this information. But developers need to take time out and study and understand what it is they're getting involved in. And you don't have to be an expert at property development from the outset because there are people out there who can help you. But you need a basic level of understanding and a basic level of information and knowledge about what it is you want to do. For example, do you want to build townhouses? Do you want to build um, single unit family dwellings? Do you want to build apartments? I mean, you, you need to figure this out on your own and, and by yourself. Where is your land? How big is it? How many units can fit on there? Um, what is your target market? Who are, you, who are you targeting? Where are you building? Is there demand for the, the type of property that you're building, where you're building it? And, and this is information that you can get from your real estate agents. If you go and talk to them, you can get this information from them. They will even show you where the land is. Your LCs can, can help you. Um, identify where these plots of land are. Uh, you also need to understand how much money you have. 
to build this property, okay? Because you, you might wish to have eight apartments, but you can only afford four. So you need to figure out how much money is at my disposal and how much money am I able to borrow? Because you don't need to have all the money that you need to develop property. You can go and get financing for it. But you need to remember certain things about financing also. Um, and before we get there, you need to ascertain how much you need to take the development from beginning to end. Okay? You can choose to do it incrementally if you want to, but still, you will need to make sure that you have enough money for the different milestones. If you say that you're going to do from foundation to wall plate and leave it at that because you want to use the money that you have, then make sure you have enough money to do exactly that. For those who are getting into debt, you need to remember that the banks will not lend you all of the money that you need to build. They will only lend you 70 to 80 percent? 70 percent. 70. They will lend you 70 percent of the project cost, not of the final value of the development. So these are things that developers need to be aware of. Okay, so you're getting the cost of your project, you're going to the bank, and they'll tell you, we'll probably give you 70% or 80%. But even then, you must have a certain amount of money before you start. You need to have some money, one, for the down payment to get that debt, and two, to do some preliminaries, you know, to do your land searches, to do your due diligence, um, to pay your architect or, or your, your, your planners for the drawings that they're going to do for you and things like that. So you need to start off with some money for yourself that you have, okay, before you actually go in and get debt. If you have strong cash flows, strong um, financial cash flows and revenue streams, that will help de-risk your project, meaning it makes it less risky and therefore more attractive to the bank to lend you this money, okay? And you also need to understand what is the relationship between the sale price, okay, and the income that you're going to get, the income stream that you're going to get from the development when you rent it, or the sale price that you're going to get at the end. So these are all very important things that the developer really needs. And as I said, the information is not in one data bank somewhere that you go, but it's it's in different places. Talk to your lawyers about doing your due diligence mm -hmm. on your title. Talk to your property advisor or your real estate agent about where to buy property, how much to pay for it. Talk to your architect about what you should build there, what can fit. Go to your town planning office. Go to your district council. Go to your city council and local planner to find out what is permissible for you to build where you want to build it, okay? What are the requirements? What is allowed? What is not allowed? Um, again, look at the market that you're building for. There's no point building something that the market doesn't want. Because remember, at the end of the day, we're chasing profit. So if you're building something that the market doesn't want or doesn't need, then you're going to build at a loss or it's going to take you a lot longer to sell whatever it is that you have built and it's going to cost you, especially if you're borrowing from the bank. And I could go on and on and on, but... Just generally, <laughs> where we are now...
give their investments time to perform. If you want a very quick return, you know, tomorrow in two, three years, then real estate is not going to be your thing, whether it's office or residential. And now is not a time to determine what is, which sector is better than the other, because we're in, in a very unique time right now. So now is not a time to really be saying, you know, one sector is better than the other, because it's, it's unprecedented. I, I hate to use that cliche, but it is. We haven't been in times like this before. So I think the, the prudent thing is to sit down and look at what your objectives are, okay? Why you're going into this investment in the first place, what you can afford to build, okay? Because if you have the luxury of doing both, or doing, you can even have a mixed-use development where you have offices and, and residential in one building. Okay? I hear you. Talking about residential, Dr. Sudil, you, you've gone into condominiums, and it's a trending thing as, as we speak. But what's the future of condominiums in Uganda? <clears throat> um, I think the condominium is the future. Why? Because um, land in cities are getting expensive. Um, and I think we have a traditional view of um, every Ugandan wants to own a house with a garden and, and, and land being expensive in the downtown, so you can only expand outwards. And, and people have been building houses and it takes them two hours to get to their home every evening and two hours to come back. Nothing wrong with that but it's the amount of time you could actually be using to increase your business. So what the future I see happening is that people will have upcountry homes, farms, but at the same time they'll probably end up having, uh, you know, from middle cost to high end apartments in town. So they'll probably work in the cities in the weekdays and Fridays maybe go up country and come back on Monday morning. That's the, the future of Kampala I see. And as far as real estate is concerned, we are planning that way, that you know, condominium is, going, is the future, it is affordable, it, and not only that, it's also secure. When you're living in, 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 in an apartment block with 100, 100 apartments, you are going to have proper security, you know, nobody, you're not exposed on, on, on the ground level, so anybody who's even trying to come and rob you will have to think twice. So insecurity is also another issue which is quite high on the suburbs. You know, people coming at night, knocking down the your gates, you know, security guard is sleeping. And that will actually push people into, you know, um, going to condominium. Now the other important aspect of uh, condominium is when somebody has worked all his life and is built, is, has got a, a, a plot on a very prime location in the center, downtown. So that comes a time when the couple, the children have been married off and they don't need a very big property. So that also could be a transition where you can actually sell your property or you can go into a joint venture with a reputable company where you said, I provide you land, you put up a 10-story apartment block, give me six apartments as my share of the land. So, you know, these are the opportunities that will come. Now, the person doing that, it's be easier for them to liquidate the cash they have in the asset they're holding and use that money while they're alive. So. So you end up into a, a smaller place between, you know, um, uh, you know, a couple who doesn't need as much space. You would have good accommodation, secured accommodation, and you'll have cash to see you throughout your remaining life. So condominium is exciting, is going to be there. And also, traditionally, uh, um, our mentality in Uganda is to buy land and over the next three or four years, as we get money, we keep building slowly, slowly. Eventually, we own a house. But by the time you, you, you look at the distance from the downtown, 
It's um, far. It takes four years to build, four, four to six. Four to five years. Be because of the income anyway. Um, but I'm seeing condominiums uh, seem to be targeting a particular population, just a small fraction of, of the population in Uganda. Now, I, I think when you say, uh, you're absolutely right when you say it takes four to five years to build a house. However, in the meantime, you're paying rent. H husband and wife, uh, now it is quite uh, normal in, in Kampala that a couple would be working and you probably pay a million, one and a half, maybe two million shillings rent. It's quite, quite common. Now, the banks have a lot of money. And I think where we are heading is that, uh, that for the banks to grow in the lending sector, I personally think one of the safest areas would be into mortgages. Mm -hmm. Now, the, a lot of the banks are going to go into an area where they will look at a couple and say, if he's paying t two million shillings rent, how, come, how can they come with a product, an apartment, which will, you know, which will make them, um, the, the, the repayment should be equivalent to the amount of the rent you're paying. This way they can grow their credit book. So that is where we're heading now. So you have the, the, you know, the middle of the range apartments and then you have the high end. So for a couple who doesn't want to do a big layout, there are some banks who actually offer those products. And I think you can look into that where you can go, ask the bank what have you got on your books and what products you can offer. So whatever rent we are paying, we're able to pay this equivalent. So in about 10, 15 years, you'll have a property of your own, and so, which is a good thing. And we're heading that way. However, um, my perspective was how do you invest in real estate? Condominium is one of them. But land, uh, investment in land is in many, many different sectors. The basic one is agriculture. And everybody understands real estate. From the day you are born and you, you go to school, one of the first things you want in life is to own your own home. So who doesn't know real estate? Okay. So, so the basic, the basic, basic of everything is the, the, how one can own his own the, house. There is knowing and there is understanding. Everybody, I think that, and that's where you come in now. You understand it more. Yes. So basically, you are coming from that sense that either you, you have a born in a in a village or wherever, and either family has a farmland or something, and from there you also want to build your own home, and. It's, it's, it's a basic right of a human being to own a dwelling, as we call, you know, and rightly so. From there, you have other types of investments. You, you would probably, the, you know, I, I'll give an example. Uh, the, the manager of my house who manages the house, he probably owns about 25 rooms. He started, um, you know, with the, with the salary he was getting from us. He would go and buy a, a room in Kamochia or places like that, you know. So now the gentleman has acquired about 25 rooms. That's all residential space. That is his, you know. Um, from the salary we give him and the bonuses he gets, he saves his money and he owns now 25 rooms. He rents them out. As we speak, doctor, we, we have a housing deficit of about... Uh, approximately 2.5 million houses. Uh, Judy was talking about uh, borrowing money and investing it in building you know, houses for rent. But at this point in time, would you advise somebody to take a loan to, to build I, a, a, res, a residential space for, for renting out? Thank you. I personally believe that your success in real estate will only come if you don't borrow money, okay? Um, real estate can be an extremely good business, but it's also extremely, extremely dangerous business. Because you can, if, if you plan it right, you can make it. If you make a mistake and 
overstretch yourself in, in leveraging or borrowing, it will bring your downfall. My, my biggest advice to anyone is, first of all, work hard, have one or two jobs or businesses, create your own cash flow, and, bu and, and build your first house without any borrowings. Then you, and to grow in the real estate sector is to have a second home, third home, fourth home. Do not borrow till you have minimum four property. And then if you want to expand, you, you can take some loan knowing that you've got rental income from four different properties. Now what happens is sometimes um, why people go wrong in real estate is that they, because his friend has got a few properties, he's borrowing money, you know, somebody makes a little money, he said, I can put down payment and let me borrow. Now, you don't plan a pandemic, you don't plan the, sure. um, the, the economic downturn. The economy is basically a demand and supply. If you have a good demand for your coffee abroad, you'll sell, you get very good prices, the country will get revenue, and the revenue will then be spent in the country. If the price of coffee goes down, you'll see the rest of the industries attached to it will also go down. So it's basically demand and supply, not only in Uganda, but outside Uganda. Because we are basically an agro-based an economy. Now the other thing is, uh, what, what sort of um, kicks off the demand is consumer. Consume, uh, consuming in a, a consumer's economy. When, when it's a consumer's economy, everything else will grow. And, and in, in a recession or downtown, the economy contracts. So, so when, when, when the consumer stops consuming, your taxation goes down, everything goes down with it. And, and one of the biggest sectors to be hit is real estate. So that's why my view is that first few properties that you accumulate or want to accumulate, avoid borrowing. It may take time, nothing happens. My business has been built over from 1986. So it's about 35, 36 years now. And we like this thing to happen overnight. And, and by borrowing, you, you, you can make it, but you can also go down very fast. So in first few properties, my, my advice is please avoid borrowing. Now, when, when there's a couple who are earning money and they're paying rent, and you have a scheme from the bank which says that your repayment is equivalent to the rent you're paying, that's okay. Because you are, either way you're going to pay the rent. So you might just get a scheme where you pay an installment equivalent to the rent you're paying. Then you're not, you're, you're actually accumulating wealth. And your, your, your rent is not vested. So mortgage is the way to go. So mortgage, yeah, those things are, are available now. And they're going to grow. Mm. Because if you look, a, a, apart from the corporates, the banks will not lend you money. Which bank in their right mind will lend you money on real estate today? Right? Yeah. That's a reality. However, one of the safest ways for the bank to lend is to pay a young upcoming couple or partners enough lending to match with their rental income or the rent they're paying. It says it's a safe bet. All right. Irene, I come to you, um, the taxman and real estate. Currently, what are the policies, the tax policies that govern the real estate sector? You, you could take us through some of them. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Yes, as explained by the fellow panelists, real estate and rental business, leasing and letting is taxable. And it's one way of contributing to our gross domestic product, but also the tax to that gross domestic product. 
as a nation, we go through taxes which are imposed on income and, and if real estate is earning income, if letting is giving you income, it is taxable under the Income Tax Act on any income, income tax under Section 5 of the Income Tax Act. But also, there are many other taxes along with that sector. We have capital gains tax under income tax again. That is if you sell this asset, or it could be a property, it could be land that you've developed, as long as it's an item that you're using in your business, it's now sold as an asset. And once you sell it, we look at the, uh, the price of sale, we compare it with the price at which you bought it, that is the cost incurred, and then any difference. It could be a capital loss, it could be a capital gain. The beauty with income tax, we only tax you when you have a profit and not when you have nothing as a gain. So we have income tax under income tax. I've mentioned we have Income Tax Act, which is income tax on rent or rental income. We have capital gains, but also we have corporation tax. If these assets are managed as corporates, if you've incorporated and these um, assets or these um, uh, things that you've invested in, in terms of uh, real estate, the land, the buildings, the um, whatever nature, you, the condominiums we're talking about, as long as they're incorporated and owned as a company, then corporation tax applies. But also we have withholding tax. And I think that is one of the areas where I think in the sector we have either, maybe we do not know about it, but I noticed that there's a lot of gap in there. On the sale of this asset, you are required to actually withhold 6%. You the seller. You the seller. When the person is buying from you, you are required to withhold 6%. And that is also another tax applicable in the sector. The beauty with this withholding tax is that you can, you can recover it when it comes to the end of the financial year. You're accounting for your income tax. This is advanced tax. So it's not like an additional tax. It's advanced tax. At the end of the financial year, you come up with your corporation tax liability less by what was withheld from you at that point of purchasing or selling the land. Uh, the other area is VAT. Now, VAT is another tax that, you know, sometimes is not very well understood, but VAT in the rental sector or real estate is VAT um, which you were res residing in. You leave it, possibly take the advice and go to a rural area and you let it out. Now, the nature of that service, if it's used for residential, you will not charge VAT. If you're using it for commercial, now the person letting it out is a company and it's carrying out business, then VAT comes in. So at that point in time, you register for VAT and under VAT, you make monthly returns of the 18% of what you've charged, less any other expenses that where you have actually incurred input tax or VAT for that matter. Um, the other area of taxation, apart from uh, VAT, income tax, and the rental and corporation tax, we also have stamp duty. Now, each time you're going to sell your property or each time you make an agreement, the law requires us to pay stamp duty on that agreement. And that is some part that we normally miss out. Stamp duty authenticates this agreement. In case you get into a dispute of sorts, what shows that this agreement is authentic is the stamp duty that you pay. And it's another area that is uh, taxable under real estate sector. Those are the taxes that are managed under Uganda Revenue Authority. But there's also property tax. Now, property tax is on the ownership, and it includes ground rates and rates. Now, this is managed under the local government authority, and it is managed under that act. However, how does this work? It ranges between 0 to 12%, depending on the area and depending on the rates applicable. So these are rates that are administered by the local authorities and they are not based on how much income you earn or how much rent you're receiving, but that's the fact that you own this property and in a particular area it is like a license of whether you are actually banking business or not. This is a rate that is applicable to that property. Yes. property tax, rental income tax. I have had uh, thoughts coming in from different people that this is like double taxation. 
URA comes, and then the local authority comes. How, how are you dealing with that? How, how are you helping people understand that actually the two taxes are different? Very good question, because at the end of the day as government, we're one body. Regard, doesn't matter who regulates what. Um, the taxes managed under Uganda Revenue Authority, that is the rental tax or capital gains tax, is tax on income earned. If you have a property and this property has no occupant, your return that year will show nil. And as long as there's no income earned, there's no tax levied in that area. I'll give you an example. We have corporation tax. If you're a company. If you have, I think here, Judy can bear me witness. When you're managing a property, you will pay tax depending on the income or the okay. occupancy that you have earned. So this income, led it by the expenses that you're having, the balance is what is taxed. Is it taxable? If it's an individual, you have your two, three, you know, rentals, one, one unit or two, depending on the size. That income, if they are not occupied, you did not earn any income, we actually do not charge you tax. So tax is basically on income and on the property. Now, the property rates on the other side is the fact that you own this piece of asset or land or building or property in a particular area so that right to be in that place is what you pay for it's like if i can compare it to kcca license if i am going to operate a, a lockup or something in kampala i'll pay in advance irregardless of whether i'm going to make money or not money but what gives me a right to stay there is what i pay for and in in the tax matters that rate is actually unallowable expense because we know it's something you incur in the cost of doing your business so those are the two things you cannot expense rental tax but you can expense property tax or ground rate that you've paid or any other rates that you have used to actually earn the income that you're going to declare at the end of the year that's the difference all right talking about uh, vat i've heard stories from kampala especially landlords collect uh, vat from the, 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 there is a rental fee then on top of that, the VAT. But again, people do not understand how this element of VAT comes in when I am paying rental fees. I am operating a boutique somewhere. Why should I pay VAT? That, that question is there as well. And if a landlord takes VAT from me and I am VAT compliant, you know, what, what happens there? Do you, do you pay back the money? What happens? Sorry. Um, yes, VAT. VAT is value added tax. In the explanation, we are taken through you start with the land, you add value, you make it something else. Land in its own way may not necessarily give you a service. But when you add value to it, and you're now going to put it to a market, you're going to put it somewhere to allow it to be used, that's the value you have added. Now, if a landlord has hit the threshold, especially when it's commercial, at that point in time, as a boutique, definitely that's commercial. So at that point, if the landlord is registered for VAT, the value he's giving you of putting you in this or allowing you this space to do your business, the, that value is charged VAT. For example, he may say so much rates in terms of square, square meters or others just the space. This one room is so much. Others would go square meter, others would go, well, it depends on the, 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 how the rates are determined. That value is what the property owner is telling you. Now, the service is 18% on top of that value that has been quoted. So how does it play out to you as the user? If you're a boutique and you're registered for VAT, this invoice or this receipt that is given to you with VAT, you are allowed an input tax credit when you file your returns at the end of the day. But what I will tell you about VAT is it's a consumption tax. So if you're a boutique not registered for tax, then you're the consumer at that point in time. 
unless you file your returns, register for, income, for VAT, and then you now have an opportunity to ask for the credit. The challenges I know in that sector are sometimes these agreements are not well signed, or sometimes it's a gentleman's agreement. Oh, the space is so much, how much? Cash changes hands, and there's up. nothing mm. to record. So that flow, now the, you, the person spending, may not benefit because there's no document to show that actually you have incurred this expense. So documentation in that area is very, very key. How do you even demand for your receipt? And besides, is it the right rent that you paid? Again, what was the evidence of payment? Because we're in a cash economy, so we would not know if it simply changes hands and there's no documentation anywhere. You may suffer silently as the consumer, as the run of this boutique, as the run of this business, because you don't have any document that supports your expense. I hear you. There was a decline, I, I mentioned it earlier, in uh, collection. Uh, construction, for example, declined by about 15 percent, 15.9, and uh, real estate declined by about 4.6. You know, um, and that's within the, the, this pandemic. Uh, call it two years, uh, approximately two years. And I am wondering, is there any incentive URA is giving to real estate developers, or you let it be? If you if you earn, you pay. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor is saying zero. <laughs> Definitely not zero. Uh, because we have services to, to give to, to our nation. We have all these things that we need to support. And indeed, we appreciate our clients for supporting us. Good question is how do we support them back? If you look at the current law as it is, 2021, first July, okay? Um, our, 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 our predictions are that it's actually going to give a lower rental return in terms of tax. Because the law has changed in that, if I can just give a brief of that, we started from, rental tax has been here all the time. Individuals has, have different rates, the corporates have different rates. Now for individuals it was 20%, mm -hmm. that's the cap for your expenses. Whether you spend so much, we don't allow you just 20%. And then? The balance is where we apply the threshold and then 20% of the tax. Now, for corporates, it was at large. 30%, but then we allow all the expenses. Now, this changed in 2015, in 2014. 2014, I think, thanks to Shelly and the team, um, mortgages were allowed. Because I think the 20% wasn't enough in case somebody borrowed money to put that asset together. So. The mortgage was allowed on top of the 20% to give some relief to the real estate um, investor, ensure that at least if other expenses are capped, at least your interest is catered for. Now, come to 2021, the current one in place, it has actually been leveled now. The corporate companies have a cap of 75%. It's no longer as it is. Then 30% on the balance, including the mortgage or interest on mortgage. The individuals, the same thing. Whereas the rate has gone from 20% to 30%, again, there is a cap for the expenses that has been now considered. So it's level ground for both individual and the, the company. What that does, it definitely af affects us in terms of URA, the rental tax that we shall receive. But I think that's an opportunity on the other side that now somebody knows that at least my expenses are catered for and the tax burden will be quite less. But of course, as we, we will review as the sector goes, we don't know what the future has. And of course, we've seen so many things changing. Yes, it has gone down in terms of the, biz, uh, the business in the central biz, business district, but we see more growing out. Now, once it grows out, that means us as Uganda Revenue Authority, we need to be able to understand these new products that are coming in, the condominium, rate, uh, re, re, uh, the condominium sector that is coming in. We are looking at guys who are doing both office and residential. And, the residential. and then out there, because there's a proposal of rates in the different areas. But at the end of the day, what is happening in the sector. We as you are need to move to appreciate what's happening in the sector and then the tax possibly also and changes to fit and address the sector to ensure that we balance both the investor that is putting in money but also to not upset or offset the other side that actually is supposed to fund our government budget.
All right, thank you. When we return in the second part, um, I will ask on behalf of a person who wants to invest in uh, real estate, who lives in, uh, let's say, Mokono, Kayunga, uh, that side. Um, these people want to understand, when do you start collecting rental income tax? I build a house, a residential space for, for renting out. Do you start immediately when tenants get in? When do you start? Or you give me some leeway, you know, of a year or two? I don't know. You, you will explain that to the viewers. If you are joining us right now, you're watching the second episode of e Bombaya Business. We're coming to you live from the URA headquarters in Nakawa. We are in Sendaula Hall. On Twitter, we are live on Twitter Spaces, as well as URA TV on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, there are also our media partners, that is uh, BBS and Baba Television. You can catch the show there as well. Uh, be sure to send in your thoughts, your questions. The panelists here will be able to respond to some of them if time allows. Let's take a short break. We'll be back. <laughs> That's my little angel rose. Together with millions of other children, my daughter Rose is assured of learning something new every day. Moses, my husband, just like many other commercial farmers, has his business supported so he can provide for us. When my other little one was on the way, even with my pregnancy complications, it was a quick, smooth ride to Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital. Also, my new baby was able to make it through his first days with the help of specialized equipment thanks to the reliable electricity which has also been extended throughout the country. All this and more has been made possible because of you. Join us and together let's do more for our country. Get your free tin at www.ura.go.ug Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority Developing Uganda Together. Kapo, you seem to be in a hurry. Where are you going to? I'm going to pay URA a visit. Why would anyone visit URA? Of all places? To know more about the Kakasa Business Solutions, namely digital tracking solution, the voluntary disclosure program and electronic fiscal receipting, and invoicing solution, which have turned my business around. You know I need to be on top of... That's my little angel rose. Together with millions of other children, my daughter Rose is assured of learning something new every day. Moses, my husband, just like many other commercial farmers, has his business supported so he can provide for us. When my other little one was on the way, even with my pregnancy complications, it was a quick, smooth ride to Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital. Also, my new baby was able to make it through his first days with the help of specialized equipment, thanks to the reliable electricity, which has also been extended throughout the country. All this and more has been made possible because of you. Join us and together let's do more for our country. Get your free tin at www.ura.go.ug. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Kapo, you seem to be in a hurry. Where are you going to? I'm going to pay URA a visit. Why would anyone visit URA? Of all places? To know more about the Kakasa Business Solutions, namely digital tracking solution, the voluntary disclosure program and electronic fiscal receipting, and invoicing solution, which have turned my business around. You know I need to be on top of my game to protect my empire. <laughs> yeah, if you know, you know. I too need to know what Kapo knows. Kakasa, be sure you are in charge of your business. Uganda Revenue Authority, developing Uganda together.
Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. In chess, the small one can become the big one. It's the same here. And here too. Watch every move. Record every number so you can plan better. No matter the size of your dream, tomorrow's success belongs to those who keep today's records clean. File your returns today. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Wait, Abu. Tuna Marilisa. And what are you doing throwing papers all over the place? I'm looking for an invoice for a sound system and cables that I received yesterday. But I can't find it. You know there is a way of keeping all this in one place and available to you as and when you need it. I really wish there was one. Because the way these invoices grow legs and disappear. I believe this is what you're looking for. Eh? eh? Now how did it get there? Tabo! Do you know that with Efris, you can stay on track of all your business transactions and improve on your record keeping? How so? Katituliku computer with Efris. I just search using the fiscal document number and I retrieve the records I'm looking for. Bookkeeping becomes simple after that. Kapo, also me. I began using URS Kakasa solutions and now I'm in charge of my business and you can as well. Kakasa, be sure you are in charge of your business. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The Taxpayers Appreciation Season is here! We recognize, celebrate, and award Uganda's top taxpayers. Be part of the online Bombaya Business Summits and stand the chance to win smartphones, gift sets, hampers, and loads more. Visit our social media pages to find out more. We appreciate you for paying your taxes. We're proud to be Uganda. We celebrate you. We appreciate you. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Hello, this is my name is Tweet Alat. Is the show guess what? In the Kualuwa Park, it's always going to be a zeku manya. But we see by your teacher, but manya could. We are looking at investing in real estate. What must you do? What must you know before you invest? And those who are already in the sector, uh, we are sharing tips as well. The panelists here are people of uh, uh, great knowledge and experience. So be sure to to learn a thing or two. The number that you can send your question to, uh, that is WhatsApp. Do not send a voice note or video, but send text. Uh, 0772 142051. 772 142051. On the set with me is uh, Shali Kongai, uh, Judy Rukasira, Dr. Sudir Paredia and Irene Mbabas. There are questions that are coming in already. Maybe um, we can clear some of them and then we get back to, to our discussion here. Uh, Sophia Chomoyendo, thank you. Uh, our city is very congested with many slums that if not well, well planned with low cost housing, uh, low cost houses could clean it up. Um, currently the construction is not organized. Do we have room to rethink as real estate developers. You understand her point. Uh, the city is uh, crowded with uh, unplanned structures. Yes, um, that's how worry. Uh, to Dr. Sudil, I seem to think that with COVID-19, the economy has shrunk. Many buildings are empty. 
but many are coming up. Are we likely to see a collapse in the real estate uh, business? Um, from, I want to know more about withholding capital gains tax and stamp duty in relation to real estate. Uh, that will be for you, Irene. Unplanned uh, uh, structures, Dr. Sudil. The, the, the city looks a, a bit crowded. You, you're not come watch. Um, that huge structure up there that is overlooking the slum. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's concerned. Is, that, is our city on there? Or, or rather cities, let, let's say cities, because in Kampala and Masaka and Bali, more or less the same. Who, who can put this in order? How do we overcome the, the, the crowding, the unplanned structures? Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think what one needs to understand is that the population of the country is growing. And when the population of, this, of, of Uganda grows, there's always going to be a demand in every sector, whether it is farming land, whether it is low-cost housing, um, you know, urban developments, uh, industrial developments, office parks, industrial parks. So the, the expansion of real estate is going to keep growing. So one, as long as you're confident in the area you are in and what is the future of your local authorities, bearing that in mind, I personally think there's still a huge prospect of growth in real estate in, in every town of Uganda. If you can see the decentralizing about 15 years ago, how all these small towns are now grown into beautiful uh, big cities around Kampala. You go to Masaka, you go to Barara, you go to Mbale, Arua, Gulu, everywhere they've actually created huge communities which are self-sufficient in terms of service providers. So the growth is there in every region of Uganda today. So I, I would, I would, you know, if, if I was ready to invest in real estate, go for it. There's nothing wrong. You, you will, wherever you do, you, if you plan it right, and the most important thing in any, any of this investment, your first thing that Judy has missed out is called location, location, location. And that, if you go to any estate agent, it's the first thing they'll tell you. Investment in real estate, again, is location, location, location. Plan your location right. If it's for um, a retail, it must be in the right location. If it's for arcades, it's in the right location. For office block, is the right location. For industrial warehousing and, and industrial park, is right location. Uh, low-cost housing creates you know, a community with schools and things like that around you. So everything, as long as it's planned and, and you look ahead, you'll get value for what you're investing in. So you, you just don't say, I, I go to this piece of land and you are around a swamp, expect value. So you plan and see what is going to happen in your area in the next five years. Right? And then you plan accordingly. Judy, does the planning um, affect price? I gave an example of uh, Bukoto. Bukoto Apartments, for example. It's a huge, beautiful structure overlooking a slum. You know, how does... How does that affect um, the pricing back here on, on this nice structure? One would want to buy, but because of the surrounding, the unplanned uh, quarters, they think twice and maybe uh, choose not to buy. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, yes, planning is, is critical, um, and it has an impact on the price of, of land, number one, before you buy it. And, and I'll, I'll approach that from a different perspective. If a piece of land does not have um, development approval or planning approval, then it will be, you, you can acquire it um, slightly cheaper than one that has, okay? Buying a plot of land that has planning approval on it for a specified user type, okay, adds value onto that, that piece of land because what it means is as a developer, you can just come buy the title or buy the land, the interest in the property, and you proceed to develop immediately. You'll have done away with that, 
you know, part of the pre-purchase stage where you have to go and find out what can I build, what can I not build. It will be very clear if you have planning permission on that. Um, on the other hand, land which is unplanned is, is mainly within high density population areas, which is the urban areas. And it tends to be extremely expensive because as you go to acquire it, before you develop it, you have to first clear the squatters. Now you're paying that on top of the price that you're paying for the, the plot of land. And it is an eyesore, yes, if you have your clear piece of land and you've built a beautiful block of apartments overlooking onto a slum, it is an eyesore, absolutely. But I don't think it's, it's going to really have that much of an impact on the price of your development because these slums are being cleared. They will be cleared eventually because a city cannot stay like that. Um, so with time, you'll find that a lot of the slums that we had before are moving and are being cleared out of the way because of the, the pressure on the land in the city. But Uganda is migrating, the rural to urban migration, 5.7% per annum. Mm. That is how quickly or how rapidly our urban our cities are growing. Okay? So whether we like it or not, if we don't plan for these areas, then the slums are going to grow, and the, urban, the urbanization rates are going to increase every year. The slum dwellings are going to increase if we don't plan for them. Because remember, who's, who's migrating? It's the informal sector, uh, usually unemployed, can't afford to rent property. So they can only afford these informal sectors or the, the really, really low-cost dwellings. And those are the ones that are growing. So the, 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 the more my urban migration increases, the more the unplanned areas are going to increase. So we'll need to find something. And what we need to do is try and draw some of this back into the rural areas. Fortunately, we have cities now, new cities, um, and they're going to have their own budgets, some of which will involve job creation, wealth creation, so that we can retain some of these um, youth in these areas that they're coming from, where they can find gainful employment, and therefore not have the urge to all come into Kampala as a greener pasture to get their bread and butter. All right. Thank you. Um, Irene, I come back to you. We, we pick from where we, we stopped about uh, you know, the tax regime as it is. I left a question in the first part that um, when do you start collecting rental income tax? Immediately tenants move in or you give me some allowance to recollect myself? Thank you. Um, when do you start paying tax? Because it all comes to that same question. When do you as a business, as an individual running a business or as a company running business start to pay tax? It comes with when you start earning annual turnover, a threshold of 10, 10 million and above. 10 million and above. Now, if you look at 10 million and above, that is earned as a, not profit, but your, you have collected. That's your turnover. So 10 million and above, if we do look at the statistics, the figures there, 10 million divided by IAM, that's about 800 something. 800 something thousand per month. Then you know that now I have to account for taxes because it's over and above. And when you look at the tax rates for individuals at that time, it was 2.8 million and 20,000 and above. So when you put that down in terms of how you earn per month, because most of the Ugandan businesses calculate per month, then that's what it comes down to. So meaning that anyone who earns above 800,000 should account for tax. It doesn't matter if you're You've recovered all your costs at that point in time. As long as you're earning, you're mandated to account for your taxes. Anything above 10 million, you file. But we also have a presumptive regime, which goes from 10 million, which was put up to 50, and then up to 150 million. Now, that threshold whereby 150 million and above in a turnover makes you vertible, but it also now takes you from the presumptive regime where we tax you on turnover and takes you to filing your returns, and now you fully account for your expenses. And it doesn't, 150 million may sound quite big for a small earner, 
But if you break it down, that is about 635,000 receipts or sales per day. If you ask anyone running a business, actually we are, making ourselves, we are doing ourselves a disservice by not even registering for VAT. Rental income, as long as you have that, fresh, that amount, beyond 10 million and above, you apply. You have to have a TIN, first and foremost, re-register. On registering, we shall give you a 10-digit figure, a TIN. That is your tax identification number. Now, that will require you to file your return for income tax. An income tax return is filed annually, once a year. In that return, you're telling us how much you've collected in terms of rent. Okay. Once you have dis uh, applied how much you've got in terms of turnover for your rent, then now we go to apply what is allowable, like I explained earlier, 75% of your turnover now is an allowable expense. Okay. So I'm left with uh, 25%. Uh, 25%. Now, that 25%, there is also another area still in the law which allows you to also include interest on mortgage, which you again also take off. The balance now is what is subjected to 30% of income tax. Okay, good explanation. Uh, Shelley, back to you. Is your association, uh, are the members comfortable with the tax policies as they are? Irene is explaining, but I don't know uh, your take on that. Thank you. I think generally no one is comfortable with, with tax. We are always looking for ways of avoiding taxation. But uh, on an overview of our sector, we feel we are overtaxed. We feel the taxes are many. Mm. They are numerous. And then we feel that you're concentrating on the few, who ha who, who, on the few developers who have property. We feel like it's like there, there's some mistrust or something with the developers. And yet, we are thinking that there's a wider base that you can fish and get that tax. So we are uncomfortable with it, yes. Uncomfortable with uh, all the taxes or a particular one? You, you know, a, a re rental... She, 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 she has listed the, the, the number of taxes. Rent, rental income caused a heated debate, you remember, last year? Uh, so I don't know, which one in particular? Or all of you them. see, if you combine them as a whole, we have rental, we have property tax, we have value-added tax, we have income tax, we have VAT, we have withholding. There are many. Twenty-two. Yes. Twenty-two taxes. For one sector. Yes. So there is a. So <laughs> when you have a property, it is subjected to all those taxes. At the end, where where does a developer, you know, make money from? Yes. Where, where do they remain? It's like. Uh, you need an incentive. I talked of incentive. I talked of incentive. You know, the conversation out there is that uh, investors from outside Uganda are given some leeway, tax holiday. You know, we hear the, yes. the stories come in. How about a Ugandan, uh, Frank, who is building some units back in Kayunga there? Why, why don't you allow them some two years, three, so that they regain? I don't know. That, that's conversation we need to take on boldly so that people stay in business. You're, you're right, Frank, and, and of course tax is, is tax. It's an obligation. Sure. It's an obligation. And maybe why it feels like it's taxing the same or focusing on the same is possibly the understanding of what is being taxed. For example, the income tax is now on your actual income as a proprietor. When you come to VAT, it's income paid by the person who is using the service. The rates you pay to the local authorities or the other regulatory bodies is an expense which reduces your final income tax or final chargeable income that is subjected to income tax. So I think it's about understanding the tax incidence of each tax that we're talking about here. Maybe I also forgot to mention that if you are in that sector and you also employ people, 
they are also subjected to pay as you earn because that's income they earn. So if you look at pay as you earn, it's yes, you may submit it as an entity, but it's not the tax incident on you. It's on the person earning the income. VAT is an incident on the person consuming the service. You get that? So at the end of the day, it's about understanding where is the tax incidence. Yes, these are the different tax in the sector. Then where is the tax incidence? And you're right, we could possibly sit and see, fine, how many of them are in this sector? And then possibly we review one by one and we see where does it come double or where is it more inconveniencing? Again, who is benefiting when these taxes come? When it comes to a tax holiday, the, the, the law is open. It gave a threshold for Ugandans, there's a threshold for foreigners. So if as a Ugandan, possibly like you said, by two or three units, possibly may not qualify for that <laughs> for the holiday. That holiday. But also it depends on what the government wants to promote at that point in time. If we want to promote things like industry, that means industry, the focus now is going to look at who is investing in that sector, and then the holidays are given accordingly. So that, that industry now grows, it is facilitated to grow, to employ more Ugandans, to produce more locally than import, and because of the implication and the trickle-down effect, now the holiday goes to that particular sector that is going to have that, uh, that effect, as government will have looked at it. So a holiday is not because it's selecting a few, but it's looking at what is the government focus at the point in time. What do we want to do at the end of the day? Do we want to see more Ugandans employed? Do we want to see more of these products that we import? being locally produced here, what do we want to do, protect our own? So basically policy is about how does Uganda want to position itself? And that determines the holiday. But as it is now, the incentive is as it is in the law, it's about your money. Doctor mentioned cash flow. How much do you have at that point in time? Does it meet that threshold? Could you, do it to, could you put it together as, a, as a, an entity, as a person or partners? Basically, so that you can enjoy that threshold Dr. Spiel, that you, want, you want to supplement on that? <clears throat> I think you made a statement where um, you talked about incentives. You know, I think we need to understand who is the policy maker and who is the implementer. Yes. Of the policy, the law, and the implementer. Implementer. So the, the, the people who make the policy about investment and incentives is the Minister of Finance. Okay. and the Ministry of Investment jointly. So there are a lot of schemes that are available for Ugandans at a very attractive terms. The, the, I think the biggest problem is we don't understand how sometimes the government works. If you ask URA to give incentives, their hands are tied. They're the implementers of the policy makers in the law. There are certain incentives prescribed which gives authority to URA, like agriculture or something, but within the context of the law, it is the policy makers who give these incentives. So the, the law being asked to go back to parliament? No, no, you see the laws are there. Yes. They've, they've created laws to give incentives. Most investors in Uganda don't, either don't bother or don't want to but there are enough incentives for every Ugandan to, if he builds a hotel, if he builds a commercial uh, a building which uh, creates jobs and invests a certain amount of money, he can go and get those incentives. They are there. Just need to understand where they are. Okay? Um, and it's available to every Ugandan. And, you know, I think it's about a threshold of $300,000 yes. for Ugandan investors for foreign people is either one million or five million. I, I, I don't know the details, but those incentives are there for every Ugandan. You just, we don't make enough effort to find out what they are. So Charlie, that comes back to you. That there, there has to be, where I started from, the questions that I started with, a centralized you know, system that can avail uh, potential investors and, and the existing developers already. Information that is important. Okay, um, may I ask you, have you ever visited Uganda Investment Authority offices? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? Yes. Have you inquired what incentives there are for you? As, as a business person, as a... As somebody who wants to invest? Not entirely. 
not entirely. So, so this is what I'm saying, that unless you yourself take, make an effort of finding what incentives are being offered to Ugandans, you'll never know. And then you have the investment, uh, Minister of Investment. They have an office where they offer you uh, export processing zones. They have their own schemes. Then the Ministry of Finance itself has its own schemes. So there are many schemes available. You just have to make effort. your own effort mm. to find out what is available to every Ugandan. And Ugandans have an advantage because their threshold of invest investment is lower. For foreign people, it's much higher. So those incentives are there for Ugandans. It's just we don't make an effort to understand them. I'm a Ugandan and, you know, if I do a project, I go and see them and I, I understand what, what is on the, what's available at the time. So some of the Im imports of your materials can be tax-free, you know, and right. things like that. All right. Be before you, you go off the microphone, um, your, your thoughts generally now, in this time that we're in of the pandemic generally, how does uh, a landlord like yourself, like the others in, in CBD and elsewhere in the country recover? We, we had uh, Judy hinting at the, was it Judy or, or Shelley, that, that uh, tenants are leaving. They are going on the outskirts and there are many buildings now that are empty. So how can one recover from this? Well, I think this is a very um, hard time um, for, for, for some tenants in certain sector. It's not hard time for every tenant in every sector. Because the, one of the hardest hit sector, in my opinion, is what you call a retail sector. Okay? But if you're, if you're um, a manufacturer and, and you are renting a warehouse, you're not hit. If you're uh, you an office, uh, uh, you know, service industry working from offices, your business has not been hit. Because your business is going on, you still need that infrastructure of an office. The biggest issue we've had is mainly with what we call arcades. When downtown was closed, those, um, our tenants could not operate. And they were the hardest hit. So we understand their situation and we would actually um, deal with the tenant to tenant, give them some um, incentives of 50% um, rebate on, 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 on rent. See, what people also must understand, there's nothing, there's no incentives or support given to any businesses in this country, either by the government through revenue or anything. Not even you had a, prob a rebate on your property rates. When your shops were closed, in, in no, most normal countries, you don't pay property taxes. But here, they make you pay. Your taxation is, you had to pay. All they said, deferred it for new months, but they never give you a, a reprieve. So there was all these things about support, support, it's all uh, philosophical, but not real. So, me as a, a you know, landlord, my job is to make sure that the tenants I have how did they keep going and make sure that they don't move out? How do I support their businesses so they continue? When they continue in our premises, we also continue. So we find a win-win situation. But there's not even one place where the government here has given incentive. Which again brings the fact that uh, <laughs> and, and there, that's fine. You know, we, we are we are a nation. Has to be bold lobbying. We are a yeah. nation which is growing, so there's no bad feeling. We all have to survive and su survive in these hard times. So, what is important from from landlord perspective is to how to keep your tenants. Mm. If I lose this one, will I get somebody better? or will it be empty? So, so we try and make sure that the tenants who are there, they also survive in business. We said to them, look, when these buildings were closed down, we had to put workers on the building there to stay 
overnight. We used to feed them, we had to give them salaries, make sure their families had money, uh, so, so everybody does a good job. If you don't clean a, a building for one week, it, it'll all get worse, and it costs more money to pet, put back into its normal condition. You had to have securities, you had to, you know, firefighting equipment, you have lightning systems. So we said, okay, for two or three months, you only pay 50%, and we'll suffer 50%, because we had already a cost. As a, as a landlord, we didn't benefit, but we didn't want to lose also. So it's to find a win-win situation with your tenants. And, and that's how you survive. Most of the, you, you know, also the, the reality is, it's only Kampala downtown which was closed. Huh? The whole of this country was open, up country. Every shop, every businesses were open. There was a lockdown only for downtown. It was uh, uh, felt in Kampala more than only Kampala. Other areas. Everything else was open. I, I tell me if I'm wrong. All right. I, I, I think I'll throw that to, to, to all of us here. How how do we how do we recover from from the pandemic in as far as rural estate sector is, is concerned, Judy? Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I think the biggest uh, impediment or challenge to recovery has been the start-stop, start-stop um, sort of a, a strategy of, of managing the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and nobody's to blame for that. I think government has responded as they saw fit. But unfortunately, um, what has happened is because of the start-stop, we've lost momentum. As, as we're just getting up and beginning to make things work, uh, as businesses are beginning to steady their cash flows, as retailers are beginning to start trading, you know, we have another wave and, you know, we have to, to stop again and have a lockdown. And starting again, that's why it's taking us long to rebound, because starting all over again takes time. So the only way to go about that, and, and empirically what has happened around the world Recovery has been fast-tracked by increasing the vaccination regime. So until we get as many people fully vaccinated, we will continue having the, the various waves, the infection rates will continue going up, and government will have no option but to continue imposing the lockdowns um, and the restrictions. Now, are there better ways of doing things like this? Yes, I think there could be. I definitely think there could be because um, we have to ask ourselves if the incentives are actually achieving what the intended objective was in the first place. Yeah. Um, for example, we are the only country that still has, you know, some of our sectors still completely locked down and, and closed. True. Sure. Okay, they're not yet open. Uh, and yet, in all honesty, do we really have a curfew at the end of the day? Or is it just a curfew in, in, um, in, in theory? You know, things like that. Um, there is no way the retail trade is going to improve when we're closing down at seven o'clock, you know, and that's the reality. Because that means restaurants have got to take their last orders at six o'clock or five o'clock and close by, you know, six thirty or seven because people need to go home. Now that sector of retail is completely dead and they're struggling. It's going to take them a very long time to recover, and it's a whole ecosystem, you know, with schools still closed. Schools are a very, very big source of of, of demand for a lot of fast-moving consumable goods, okay, which feeds into the bigger economy, and the ecosystem continues working and, and functioning vibrantly. Until that happens, we're going to have an impact on the other side. Manufacturers are going to be impacted as well. Um, and and it, it, it's all interrelated and interconnected at the end of the day. You know, if, if retailers are struggling and the consumers are not there to buy the goods, then the landlord struggles as well, because they have to give rebates, because the tenants cannot afford to pay their rent, because the shopping malls and arcades are suffering, they've got no patrons coming in. I think I'm, I'm building the whole picture now and you can see the story there. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to recover? I think we will just need to hope that you know, vaccination rates um, increase, okay? that infection rates are kept as low as possible, uh, that we can get in, try and attract uh, more business into the, into the country and into the economy so that our hospitality sector also becomes vibrant again. We need to get um, more passengers coming in because it's the same people who are feeding into 
the, the retail sector, okay? Um, business needs to stabilize and, and begin to pick up in earnest because the, the office traders as well, the, the office occupants are business people. So if business is low, they don't have enough money to pay their rent and vice versa. All yeah. right, Irene, uh, quarter one seems to be an indicator of a future that won't be so good uh, going forward um, in as far as real estate is concerned, seeing from the decline in the first quarter. But your thoughts quickly on how this sector can, can recover so that you are is able to get something more from there. Thank you, Frank. Um, from the sector players, there's hope. All is not lost because, yes, the economy is not yet op fully open, but at least we see a difference from when we're in a total lockdown to now when we're at least partially you know, open. Of course, um, businesses may not have gone to 100% as we want them, but also I'm aware that some of the businesses changed form. They may not necessarily be out in the shop, but Charlie mentioned the online. The, the, the form has, has changed. So we are banking on, uh, as we incrementally open, as we beca become more active, uh, Judy has mentioned a very important part of the school and how it plays into the economy. But what I would maybe use this opportunity to is to embrace our new innovation of electronic invoicing. Now that tells us a lot of what's happening in terms of transaction. This is a real-time system that shows the invoicing because we are in a cash economy where we can't track these transactions. But we can possibly, if we have all this information in one place, maybe our policymakers, the Ministry of Finance, could see, because that would show you the level of transaction. That could show you the impact of some of these things on the sectors that we're talking about. But without that information currently, we may not know what's happening out there. We may have to maybe estimate or, or I mean, imagine. Yet, these are real things. But until, as a tax authority, we are required to get these statistics, we do not have them, then we cannot support possibly adequately the policymakers. So I implore everyone to, to acquire electronic invoicing or receipting if they are not registered for VAT so that it can be sent. It, it, your transactions will be sent. And your it frees, how okay. has it been helpful in the real uh, estate sector? In the, real in, the, in the last one year or so? Well, the, averagely before I even go to just the real estate. Averagely, um, I think we have enrollment, we're at around 60%. would love to be at 100%, but the real estate especially, we will need to work together to see how do we help them in this particular area. Because largely, what is affecting the real estate sector in terms of taxation is lack of documentation. So this would be a very, very big step in telling us what's happening in that sector, how is it being affected, who is earning, uh, Shelley mentioned the value chain. Who actually benefits in this whole thing? Because there's a quite a number of people in there that are not in this sector or are not even anywhere but are earning from the sector. So once this, um, this, um, this system is adopted, it will give us a lot of insight in what's happening in the different sectors. Thank you. Um, Shelley, your thoughts on recovery? But, but before, uh, viewers, you can send in your questions or uh, remarks on 0772 14 20 51. Uh, send a WhatsApp message or a traditional SMS as we know it. I'll be able to read some of those questions or remarks uh, shortly. Shall back to you. How, how do you recover from the pandemic going forward? Yes, as long as the population keeps growing, uh, real estate demand will always be there. Uh, and we know that uh, every year we have uh, 300,000, I think, new households, and majority are in urban centers. We shall always grow. As long as the, we are not going back to another lockdown and we are vaccinated, as Ms. Judy said, uh, there's hope uh, that the sector will grow because the economy now is active, uh, people are trading, uh, we, we are seeing the tourists are coming in. Uh, even though the schools are closed, they are operating online. They are, like, people are teaching online and they, they, they are earning. So money is circulating and uh, it, we are sure with time we are going to be uh, better. 
And I'm certain Irene and team have ideas on how to access that uh, online system as well to, to be able to get something. <laughs> All right, from Ranjit Singh, greetings to, uh, to, to URA and special respect to Dr. Sudhir as my great mentor. I think you know each other. Well, Dong Simon to Dr. Sudhir, kindly throw more light on how me as a low income earner can pay for a condominium yet they demand for a huge down payment. Can you repeat that? Okay, he wants to understand how, um, as a low income earner, sorry, as a low income earner, how can he pay for a condominium? You, you could explain to, to him what it takes to, to own a unit on a condominium <coughs> property. Well, um, this is what I was saying earlier that you work out the amount of rental you are paying and if you're able to get a bank who can lend you money to buy housing which fits in with your rental payment, then I think uh, 10, 15 years is not a long time. You know, 20, 25 year mortgage in Europe is quite common. Because I, I remember about my first house when I was uh, 18. 18. 18 years of age. I saved enough money um, to buy my first house uh, and I got a 25-year a mortgage. Um, you know, but I think if we can find, uh, there, there, there are a lot of products available and there are also certain developers who can give you five years uh, a kind of, they built in your cost but I think they actually um, uh, can give you low cost uh, uh, condominiums which where you don't pay for five years and you save that money and then you know reduce your borrowing letter so there are a lot of schemes you need to under understand the schemes okay I, I think that the down payment seems to worry people a lot I have had this uh, sorry the down payment the, the, the payment the first payment that you make at once seems to worry people a lot no we we had a um, well, in my opinion, um, you, you had Stenbeck who was quite aggressive in this market and they are also looking at the schemes where you don't have to make a down payment. As long as you have a job okay. where they can see the continuity and as a secure job, mm -hmm. I think it should not be a problem. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. um, my view, uh, my concern is about low income Earners. Why is building in Uganda more expensive, yet it is among uh, low developed countries? Judy, why? Uh, Dr. Sudil was sa saying earlier that, uh, which, which is the fact anyway? It takes four to six years to complete a house, you know, if, if you are a normal uh, income earner, uh, that is. So, somebody is asking, why, why is building so expensive? Why, why does it take this long? Could it be a factor of uh, cost uh, for, for, for the building materials, what, what it is, what, what is it? Yeah, I think it's a combination of many things. I think um, <laughs> land generally is, is quite expensive here. Um, if land is not a third of the value of the project, if it's more than a third of the value of the project, then it's, it's too expensive and, and the numbers begin not to make sense. But um, the other reason is that the cost of materials is also quite high. Um, I think East Africa has one of, one of the highest costs of cement globally for one reason or another, um, but mainly because I think the capacity for uh, cement manufacturers to build enough cement um, to supply the country is, is limited. So you find that we, we have a bit of a, a challenge when it comes to the cost of, of building materials. Um, a lot of the finishing and fittings are also imported because, um, uh, and the taxes on that is quite high. So when you're importing you know, all your finishes and fittings, obviously the price of your, of your, the cost of your property is going to go up as well. Labor is relatively cheap, so that's not too much of a problem. Um, and then again, most importantly, the cost of finance is very high. Mm -hmm. So when you add all that together, it, 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 it compounds the cost and it makes it quite expensive at the end of the day. So you need to look out for uh, which kind of, of house you want, um, try to save for it, 
I think those are some of the tips now. If, yeah, if you want um, to support Bubu. Some of a lot of the products that we can find here, we can now get steel here. We can get tiles here. Um, I think we can get paint. It's just the finishes and fittings, maybe that we need to also work on and see if we can get good quality here. Okay. Yeah. Innocent Ingaria, thank you for for the thought. And, uh, uh, Eric Can Can Candano. Uh, to Dr. Sudeo, what amount can someone who wants to venture in real estate start with? Is there a blueprint for that? Uh, the, the, the amount will really depend on uh, uh, the, the kind of the economic uh, 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 level or whatever you want to call it. It's, you see, you, you can't be in a certain income level and you want to invest $10 million. So you need to look at the, the economic uh, level you are in and, and, and go for those projects because there's, there, there's income from every sector of the economic uh, uh, level of people. There's income which suits that level that you, know, you can invest in a property of that level and then eventually grow. You know, um, so it's, it's very relevant to the, the amount of capital you have and where to invest. Okay. Um, somebody is asking, what are the tax incentives for financial year 2021-22 for new investors in uh, agroforestry? I think it's what you wanted to write, agroforestry and mixed farming, where a lot of employment can be generated in villages and keeping cities less crowded. That's Ranjit. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Motatina, uh, how are those that rent warehouses catered for in the tax system structures in terms of encouraging investors to engage in trade? Is that, does it make sense? How are those that rent warehouses catered for in the tax system structures in terms of encouraging investors to engage in trade? Um, to, Mrs. To, to Judy, uh, the statistics on the growth of the middle class exaggerated? That's a question. Is this the reason why we see big retail shops closing shops a lot often now? Okay, you, you understand it? Are statistics on the growth of the middle class exaggerated? The conversation that the middle class is now you know, growing. Uh, yet he's saying uh, sh shops are closing. The, the two do not correlate at, at all for him. Um, do, do you want to to reply to, to this warehouse question? It's about... Um, um, how are those that rent warehouses catered for in the tax system structures in terms of encouraging investors to engage in trade? Oh, renting warehouses in terms as they're, as they're doing their business, possibly? Maybe that's what they're looking at? What incentives they get? <laughs> well, well, because for me that's I an don't expense. seem to make it out clear. That's an expense that, like I said, we need to document for all expenses for anyone to benefit from an expense. Documentation. 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 Others, when you're in a business, you're hiring a warehouse, you don't have any documentation. It definitely comes back to you as a cost. Judy, is the middle class figure exaggerated? Um, I don't think I'm qualified to to really <laughs> comment on that. Um, but maybe what I'll add on, on to that is that um, there are different reasons for different organizations leaving the country. Um, I don't think on top of that list is, is because they're not doing well necessarily. Um, and I think if they're making reference to people like ShopRite, it's just their model to exit after a certain number of years. Um, they've been in Uganda for 18 years, for example. So I think it's time for them to exit um, uh, the investment um, and if that was the case then we wouldn't have another big player buying them out and taking over so I don't think it's necessarily a hundred percent true to say that you know because the, the middle class number is exaggerated businesses are closing because other businesses are queuing to take over um, Carrefour is, is just as big you know as, as ShopRite and they're very they're very happy to fill that space so I, I don't necessarily think that that is the case all right, uh, thank you so much. We're coming to the tail end of this. We have about uh, five minutes or six to conclude. I request that each one of you uses a minute of that um, for closing remarks. Uh, I'll start with you, Shelley. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to encourage the, the public that uh, the sector, although it's under pressure now, does not mean that it will not recover. We are in the recovery mode now. We just need to embrace the challenges and use the challenges to propel ourselves to uh, a better place. And I would also like to speak to the government and say, please, let's prioritize real estate. Let's have policies that, are, uh, that, that will be able to enable real estate to grow further and to encourage investors to come to Uganda and invest in real estate. To the tax max master, I would like to say, please consider the real estate. It is overtaxed. Widen the space and in, bring in more uh, taxable persons. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Sudil. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I feel that Together you know, with real estate of other is children, my daughter Rose one of the safest business one can ever have for investment purposes. You, when you consider your treasury bill or your bank deposit rate against the uh, your real estate, your re real estate in the long term will grow faster. Money in terms of currency will devalue and eventually um, uh, disappear. Or, or the inflation will eat it. Whereas inflation proof is your real estate. Over the years, your, your building will remain, or buildings or your land will remain, and it will grow. So long term, as long as you, you plan your investment right, if you have land, you make sure that you have a, 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 a project for the land to make it grow, either in terms of agriculture or put a commercial thing on it. Keeping money in the bank, it's not a good idea. Okay, it's not a good idea. Right. Inflation will eat up your money over the years. So buildings will still be there today, 50 years, 100 years. The land will be there. But plan it right. Don't make a mistake of borrowing. And you see, the other thing you must understand, when you have money, balance between what you can afford to lose. Losing in the sense that when you put, a, put money in your building, that money is gone from your cash flow. So you can only put what you can forget. And don't overstretch yourself. You know, get a smaller property. After five years or four, you get another one and another one. So just make sure that whichever real estate business you're going to, manage your cash flow. Once you put money in the real estate, it is gone. What comes out of it is your profit, and that's what you must rely on. And if you do that way, I think you cannot fail. But you cannot go wrong if you plan it right. Thanks so much. Judy, let me not, please. Um, thank you, Frank. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Ray, for putting this together. I think these are very useful uh, discussions and sessions that, that are very good because you know, the public gets to really understand what happens in the sector. Um, and an opportunity to ask us questions. I, I think without taking too much time, I would like to agree with what Dr. Ruparelli has said. Start small um, as a developer. You start off small and you grow as your, your income allows you to grow. But I will second what he says about real estate. It's an excellent asset class to hold, um, particularly if you're using it as a diversified portfolio. If you look at Dr. Parelia's portfolio, you'll find that he's in agriculture, he's in uh, education, he's in hospitality, and he's in real estate. At the moment, real estate might not be doing very well, but there will be another sector that's doing well because they are negatively correlated. So where real estate is doing well, agriculture might not be doing well, but maybe hospitality will be doing well. So you'll find that real estate is a good buffer for the different asset classes that you hold. But you can start small, grow it slowly, and please give your investments time to perform. You have to know that there is a lead time. You don't you know, sow the seed and invest today, and you expect supernormal profits tomorrow. You have to give your investments time to perform for you to be able to see if they're actually profitable or not. Um, Thank you so much, yeah. Judy Rugasura, Managing Director, Knight Frank. Irene Bawazi. 
Thank you, Frank. Um, I just want to correct one in a minute. Um, the income tax rates for 10 million are for other businesses. For rental, it's as long as you make the threshold of 2.8 and above. 2.8 two? 2 million. 2 .8 that million. was the previous Annually. one, but now everything as you earn it. Okay. The law has since changed okay. everything. I just wanted to correct that, but also to encourage um, the real estate. Indeed, there's potential. 44% of Ugandans rent houses in Kampala. So there's that potential. We would want to work together and pledge to work together with you to get the other players in the sector and other products that we can tax. And together we will build Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene Mbabazi, um, Judy Rugasura, Dr. Thank Steel you. Paredia, and uh, Shari Kungai. And uh, that is the end of the second episode of e Bombaya Business. We've been coming to you uh, live from Nakawa at the URA headquarters. Thank you for watching us, those who are, who were live on uh, URA TV on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you. On BBS and Baba TV, uh, Twitter Space. Thank you so much. And those who followed our hashtag. Uh, time has limited us. I haven't uh, looked at Twitter, but I know uh, many thoughts are there coming in. Thank you so much. Next Friday, uh, 29th October, uh, it will be Trade and Investment Opportunities in Uganda. Be sure to catch the session uh, Friday, once again, uh, 10 a.m. up to 12 p.m. My name is Frank Walisimi. Have a good time. That's my little angel rose. Together with millions of other children, my daughter Rose is assured of learning something new every day. Moses, my husband, just like many other commercial farmers, has his business supported so he can provide for us. When my other little one was on the way, even with my pregnancy complications, it was a quick, smooth ride to Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital. Also, my new baby was able to make it through his first days with the help of specialized equipment, thanks to the reliable electricity, which has also been extended throughout the country. All this and more has been made possible because of you. Join us and together let's do more for our country. Get your free tin at www.ura.go.ug. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Kapo, you seem to be... My name is Pedison Mombere. I write for Smart24 TV Business Desk. My question is going to directly to URA. There is a 118% VAT that we imposed on the arcade owners, but they have carried that burden again to the tenants. I'm telling you what I get from the field. So where is URA intervention in this? We have not seen anything coming out from you. Tenants are crying because of this burden. Now, another question is going direct to Dr. Sudir. I was listening to you very well. You said plan, plan, plan. But you're the same person who said, don't borrow to invest in real estate. But here's my plan. I can as well borrow. I built up my house. Huh? Then what I get in turn, then I start paying a little, the money that I borrowed from the bank. Isn't that a good plan? Can't I start from that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Smart24. So one question goes to Irene, the next to Doctor. Anyone else? I'm Samuel Mwesgwa. I work with Baba TV. I'm just pleased with today's discussion. My first question goes to the URA tax administrator. Frank was trying to ask about the double, the double taxation when you are trying to explain about the ground tax or the property tax, rental tax, and others. I need a more elaboration about that. They seem to be the same because somebody paying ground tax is owning a property. And when you say that, again, when he's earning income, he's going to pay rental tax, then why can't we scrap off one? And I think that's one of the taxes maybe that they are crippling businesses for law earners to begin such businesses. Lastly, it goes to doctor. 
you've made a statement that I once heard from another foreign investor saying that don't keep money in the bank but use it for investment. Keeping money in the bank, you meaning those people that are having large amounts of money because you've been talking about and encouraging people to save. Our people going to save for large business like estates business if they are not going to save with banks. Which ideology or which knowledge can you give to the public? Thank you. I'm Samuel from Baba TV. Thank you, Samuel. <sighs> Apologies, I just forgot it was a Friday. Uh, my name is Hakim Wampamba. I work with NBS Television. First, to you are a. Uh, we are aware that uh, the government of Uganda signed an agreement or a contract with Riponami to increase, uh, to come up with a system that will improve compliance when it comes to rental tax. Uh, how far have we gone in that particular direction? And if uh, it has been able to yield, kindly put us to speed. And uh, to all the other panelists, real estate protagonists, as they call them, these people from the fourth estate, is the real estate sector in Uganda stretching up to its potential if we still have a concept and a law that speaks about real estate investment trusts and we've not seen any? If there are any suggestions from you, kindly put them forward to see that uh, the sector can stretch to its rightful potential. Many thanks. value added tax. So when you have a business, you produce, say, a bottle of water, or you let your property, the value that you add to that property to make it rentable is what is taxed. Mm. Now, it is a tax you pay on a sale or a payment, but also as a trader, it's a tax you pass on to the consumer such that at the end of the day, the tax paid by the consumer is the b each of the persons in the chain pays their VAT bit. So the business owner will have VAT incurred from the landlord, but it will become part of the business that when he sells, the VAT he paid to the landlord is recoverable once he declares his sale. So it only affects you, like I said before, if you're not registered for VAT, you become the final consumer at that point in time. So I encourage everyone to register for VAT in business. The second one from Samuel was double taxation, property tax and rental tax. Of course, they look similar. The word tax is, is at the end of it all. Rental tax, property tax. But I said property tax is a license. It is a fee you pay to have or to own that area or that property. Rental tax is tax on income earned from letting or leasing of your property. So the two are different. Property tax, you'll pay it, I'm sure, whether you actually earn income from it or not. Rental tax is only when you earn income. If you do not have any income from that property, we do not talk tax at that point in any way. The second one is property tax is an expense that is acknowledged for companies as part of the expenses. So it doesn't become an extra expense because you allowed it you allowed it you allow it as a deduction to your ex, as a, as an expense when you're accounting for your income tax at the end of the year um hakim riponami right yeah government signed a contract that was uh, late last year with a, a private consultant to help us use geospatial geospatial technology in terms of locating properties like I said, things are changing. We are no longer in Kampala where we see, you know, Loom Street and you count one, two, three, four. Properties are going out, they're out there as we speak. So we want a technology, or this technology is going to help us locate them. It's going to help us tell us the tenancy um, rates and possibly give averages of the rent or, or fee that is paid for that area. So it's in progress. We are not yet 
um, implementing it for now because of a number of uh, stakeholders that are still engaging with because it regards data, it regards a number of um, inputs from various stakeholders. So we expect it possibly by end of this financial year or next year or next financial year, possibly we can see the products from it. For right now, if we're still doing the groundwork and then we, will, we are yet to benefit from it, but it's going to look at the information that is available on the GS special. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Judy had some questions. I think it was REITs. Um, the gentleman from NBS was asking about REITs. Um, and he's asking if, the potential, if there is potential in this market, if we've reached our full potential with regards to property investment, because we haven't yet engaged in REITs. Um, I think we've made a good start. The law on, uh, on, on the formation of REITs has already been passed. Um, on the IREITs especially, not the development REITs, but the investment REITs espe most especially. And I think what is lacking and why they haven't really taken off is mainly because of a lack of sensitization of the market. I think we need to do a lot more in sensitizing the market about what they actually are, what the advantages of investing in a REIT is, um, and, and get people to understand that it is possible to own a small unit of an investment as opposed to owning, waiting until you can afford to own a big investment. So it's just getting the public to understand that there is this opportunity where many different people can own a bit of a property if you club together, okay, as an investment trust, other than waiting for you to get your own money and build your own. So I think it's also the level and maturity of the market that we're at that hasn't yet appreciated this concept because they have no track record of it working. So it will take one to kick off and be successful and then we'll continue to see others coming along. Unfortunately, the one in Kenya, um, the Fahari REIT has not performed as well as it should have done. Um, so that hasn't given a lot of confidence to interested parties in the market to do it here, but I think it's something that still has a, a bright future if we sensitize our market about how REITs perform. Thank you, Judy. Uh, doctor, you had a question? Well, I, I think um, my bit of advice when, when you are buying a condominium is and this, it is not practiced here very much, but you, when you're buying a low-cost housing or, or an apartment and condominium, I think as part of your agreement, you must ask a landlord to give you a copy of the, um, the planning permission he applied for, and then also planning as built you also need a copy of the NEMA certificate to make sure that the house, the property is built, is built it legally. Then, then after that, you also need a, a what you call occupation certificate, meaning that when you build your property and you comply to all, all, all the laws of building, the local authority will give you occupation permit. And, and after that, you also must get a certificate from the fire uh, um, th th there's a, a firefighting thing we, we, we have to get a certificate from, and there's also for the lift to be certified that it is in uh, working order. So when you're buying a property, make sure if, you, if, you, if, the, if the building you bought is, is properly built, then you should have all these things available to you as, a, as your right as a tenant. It, and 99.9% .9 of Ugandans don't even ask for them. Which is sad because then you find you, you, you build a property which was not properly uh, uh, authorized. It was not approved by uh, uh, environment authority, local authorities. It is not fire regulated. You know, all, all these things are, it's your own legal right to make sure you have them. And a good builder should have them. 
But if you buy in the wrong area and then you find that, the, you know, it is in a no-build designated area, then you only blame yourself, nobody else. So always look for a good, reputable builder. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will have uh, the Uganda session. This, in particular, will focus on Irene, just to explain, in summary, uh, the issue of rental tax and also the issue of VAT on commercial buildings, just to make sure that there are people out there understand it. And uh, if there's any other question, I, CTV, you told me you had a question in Uganda. So just ask it, then Irene will answer in summary, uh, rental tax and how we apply it for this uh, financial year, but also the VAT issue that has raised concerns among the landlords and tenants, especially in Kampala. Baba, you had a question? Dr. Sudila, I don't know if you speak Uganda. In this summer, I'm going to TV. I'm going to be tax administrator why you are a URA. There was in summer, I'm going to Uganda. To have a spell of two years, COVID-19, we are going to be Uganda. You are a estate business. Na katutuali estate business. Chichiche tuwa filwa. Because tuwa de tulaba, niti haba mkuba ntuwa wa mayumba business za galao. Mwibuga na abali msemi urban areas. Pasenta jichiche tuwa filwa nga yu ala e, ezazi lino kuyi ingira. Then, neba nanyini bizimbe vyo. Chichiche wa filwa. Wuma msobolo kuwa tenga mshipima. Akase mbayo, ndoza chigenda kuwela jeno. A government we are here to relief programs. While we send us the UDB to our galote get abamu kuba estate owners. Mwa abamu kuba ntu abali bali na ok benefitinga kusente zosimani oba mwafuna ko essentials za UDB. Neanziza. We bali nyosama. No zechu zechu oba cha cha chigena genda wa mami Frank wa Lucy. Nae, uh, ndoza, after if we listen from uh, Irene and then we move on. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eve Masawi from CTV. My question was specifically going to Shali Kongoi, but I don't know if you can speak Luganda. But uh, I, I wanted you to give me a brief on uh, the bit where you talked about uh, people moving from the city outside the outskirts of Kampala, a, a very brief bit on that. But also, um, we'd like to understand what advice would you give to uh, real estate owners? Well, you said that the people are running away from the expensive rent to no more rent that they can afford. So it means that the real estate owners are being affected, especially those with the uh, expensive. I can't, I can't understand you. Sorry? I can't get her. You, you, oh. yeah, you need to be a bit clear, please. <laughs> okay. I was basically asking uh, Shelly to give an advice in Luganda. Advise. Uh, re oh, I don't know if it's Adrian who can help us with that. Uh, an advice to real estate owners who are being affected by the fact that uh, people are, are moving to the, outside, uh, to the suburbs, outside the Kampala suburbs. Thank you, Eve. Yes. Uh, Shali, I, I don't know if you picked it. Uh, probably yes. after Shali, then we listen from Irene. Yes, I would like to say that, uh, of course, uh, real estate is also subject to the forces of demand and supply. And uh, if people shift from, from uh, the CBD to go and do their businesses in the suburbs, it does not mean that the, real, the, 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 the CBD business is going to collapse, but it is just, I think, uh, shaping, like setting uh, the, the forces of demand. So if the demand 
or if the, the demand is now for the, the, the property in the suburbs because they are cheaper, then the landlords in the city center will be forced to reduce their prices and if the prices are accommodative to, 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 the, to the demand, definitely we shall see the shift even back to town. So there will be, basically it is the forces that determine that will be static forever. That is just something, a trend now, because people are trying to cut their expenses. But, and people are trying to restructure and trying to see what, how they can use the monies that they have at the moment. But that does not mean that that is what it will be forever. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shelley. Uh, yes, Dr. Sudili had something. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think it's a very important question of why we should continue investing in suburbs. You see, <clears throat> when, when your CBD eventually is going to become um, um, all business oriented, offices, uh, retail and all that, what is important that when the population grows, it can only grow outwards. Now, now what is important is in every suburb around Kampala, it's important to create a community, a community where you have your retail, you have your schools, hospital, which are um, accessible within uh, a short time and distance. So it, it is not wrong to in invest in suburbs. In fact, it's the right time to keep investing in suburbs. In, in few years time, the suburb will also become a very important part of a satellite towns as we call them. So planning ahead, this, it's a good idea to start investing in suburbs. We're also planning to move and also invest in, while we're investing in CBD, we also will go and invest in suburbs. So, so there's nothing wrong, and I think it's a good move to do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudil. Irene? Muluganda, to where I will. Our Udi Zabafe Abalunji to Vandiza Eda to Weber Zanyo Oku, Wanida Eguang and Bien Badida, Abian Simbi. Omar Kaguno Om Solo Oguvan Bien Simbi, Abian Rental Tax, to Chiite Om Solo Kuba Kuba Pang Kuba Land Lord, Abainaba Pangis, to eat a wish. Omsolo guno, guabika bimeka. Chino kusoka guwaita income tax. Omsolo kumfuna yo, ngatumazo kujako, ngatufunye enfuna yo, netuja kensa asanya yo, church sigara wo kwetuteka omsolo guno. Omsolo guno, guli evi, omsolo guno guli evi tundu wa satu, kubuli chikumi, evi sigara wo, ngomazo kujako, evi tundu nsanfu muetano, 75%, kubuli chikumi. Ngen sasa nyeyo. Eda, om teka lino, likuwa omu kisa, okuja kwa ne sente, eza interest, tujiite interest mbuganda, interest teke wako boba wafuna mortgage. Amagoba. Amagoba, kusente ze wafuna, ngaba kuwa mortgage, okusobulo kuzimba, ebi zimbe bino. Kalo msolo uguo, guno mwaka, Gwake ndere ze duwako. Ore nsonga eyo evadeo ora COVID. Musolo cho mlala ukuteke buwa kubupangisa. Bobango upangisa echi zimbe cho. Nge echi zimbe chino chiriko business endala. Nge echi zimbe chino techisuru wamu. Olino musolo mlala gosa sura. Gwe tuita VAT, Value Added Tax. Omsolo gunu, guabitundu kumi na mnana, kubulichi kumi ku sente ezo mpangi sao za wa akusasula. Omsolo omlala oguli kubupangi sa. Ntibu obanga, ebizimbe bebe vinji nyo, obange nkola yo, yetaga abantu abakozi, ngoli mkozesa, 
Gwenga landlord. Abantu bano boko zesa. Ngoba omu sara abili mwezi. Ogu soka mamituara abili mwezi satu mweta. Sente zino zijibu wako. Pay as you earn. Msolo cho mlala oguli kubopangisa. Ntibo obo tunda echi zimbe chino. Obo tunda in a developed land. Echi ntu chokula akula nyiza. Chiba era ko chetuita capital gains tax. Capital gains tax gwe msolo. Ama goba gobo je mkutunda evi zimbe vyo. Okugeza. Bobe echi zimbe chino. Etaka nebye wateka ko. Ngabia kutuwa lida obi ya lao ensimbi katugeze haka umbika mu. Obo obu kadekumi ukusinzi na angabuoli. Tuso kane tujako ezi sente zi wasasani. Okugera gera nyanezo zi wafuna. Obazo ogendo kufuna. Ama goba gogobo ufunye mkutunde chizimbe ichu. Tuteka ko omsolo gwe tuita capital gains tax. Ngotunze e chizimbe. Era Omuntu oyo, omulala akwatibu wako, mwizimbe, obobu pangisa, ye muntu aba aguze echizimbe chino. Nti omuntu obobu tunde echizimbe cho. Olinga agendo kusasula, babata na kusasula, akuja koche tuita 6% withholding tax. 6% bebitundu mkaga, kubulichikumi kweze cent, ezigendo kusasulwa kwenga na njini chizimbe. Na ye sentezo, omwa kanga guwedeko, ngo otuko meza oche tuita return. Return ye mbadide yo omwa kago, oba mbadide ya business yo, ngo omwa kago guwedeko. E omanya, sente mekazo yidon kusasula, nge banja, edia income tax e YURA. Na ye no jako zili, eza kutole buwako, nga ba kusasula, eti zimbecho, chewatunda. Kale, jeje msolo e jenja ulo. Tu inaono msolo omulala, Gwe tuita property tax, omsolo uguo, the rates over, o, e, chikuwa oruksa. Ukube na mchitundu echo, iranga e, msolo ejo, ji, ji vunanjizibu wako, aba local government, mungeri ya property rates, o ground rent. Chesinza kwe davida, ye stamp duty. Stamp duty, gwe guo msolo, ogusa suriwa, Kuburi agreement yu na okukaka santi dada. Enu agreement yu ntufu. Ida agreement yu bebe tuwa liba mkoti. Iba ko stamp jetu ita embossment. 1% of the value. Chichitundu chimu. Kuburi chikumi. Echo muendo. Ogwa. Ogwa. Ogwa indagane yu. Chiba. Eyo gira ko. Kale. Mbufunze. Gwego msolo. Oguri. Uh, Wewe ni nyo, Irene, uh, jine misoro Irene jayo gilako, tini musoro mopia. Aba mauli ili bate loku gena ni wagamba, wakubabu badi tepamanyi. Ni wagamba, e misoro ya mipia kuwapangisa. Everything she has said are existing, set existing tax regime that has been applying to the rental income tax, rental uh, tax regime. She's only trying to explain it better so that we understand it. Na ye mbufunze, mudachika nge mu, okugeza, kubitundu nsambu mbitano, ye bitunda habiri mbitano, gezeze za ko, mwema mfunye milio ni bili, ngandi landlord. Mwema mfunye milio ni bili. Tugeze kuchangu, nga milio ni kumi. Milio ni kumi, yes. Milio ni kumi zofunye mumuaka gwena mbapangi sabu. Milio nezo kumi eteka likuwa dietu inakati. Likuwa allowance jite deduction orensa sanya yo ebitundu nsafu muetano kubulichi kumi. 75% kumilio ni kumi ze milio ni msafu ne chitundu. Ezigendo kusoko kujibu wako, osigaze bidi na ichitundu. Buwabanga toina loan, omusolo gugenda kuba 30%, owe bitundu asatu, kumidi yoni bidi na ichitundu, zo sigazao. Era 30% of 2.5, omidi yoni bidi ichitundu, ze mamangu about 600 and... 
mtualunga ankaaga ne just a quick one nga ankaaga mweta ana roughly buli mwaka buli mwaka omsolo gwenjogera ko gwa mwaka si mwezi nga vatwabera so bo chitunulamu ofunya chinene kubange nsanvu mweta anezo zezi kuweredwa Okulavo in Sasanya, I have much is in the chins of Banga Chipia, not to inanula Sasanya Marco. Now you are all in now, or battle in now. You take a liquid day deduction. Liquid day of weather intense between the sun of Meta and Kulichkumi, Bigenda, Kuketa, Kukufako, Sasanya, Okulavan gets in the chinachkolachi, she dated Saint Ezo, Zobo Yanju de Mark. Kali, Bakubiza, Nti, where did the cat take Liamba nyo ye tugen digena tuko sa ngafaba kunganya kubanga litu wa much less in terms of tax collection. Na ya te gwenga landlord. Diku what day akalembe disa. Mutisela chino. So, abaina of e, 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 zimbe vya mwe, bambi mwe wandisi. Kubanga we mte wandisa, ate tugenda kwa sa dato mlela tuto tuina geospatial, tulina Oxinzida kumita zozori na izama sanya na zee izama zee tu genda kosa data mungi kala chanya vada chini mungi o kosa opportunity eno no jana we yanjule ri yuara e na ugamba ni nevi zimbe we biti tu jaku isamu tu ina office e kora chimu choka omusolo kupanga sa jetu ita rental office e ri one si one we to today just rental office so tu be tu basaba muge mu wandi se tu jaba igiriza. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, let's appreciate the panelists once again. Thank you for the good job you've done. Thank you, Shali Kongai. We appreciate for you coming in front here and sharing your wisdom with us. And also thank you, Doctor, for the wonderful uh, insights that you've given us today. And we appreciate your gesture. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate as Uganda Revenue Authority. Thank you, Irene. Uh, was Oje Katonda Kongereko, eh? Ayongereko, Akudizeko, eh? Then, uh, Frank, of course, Frank, thank you as usual for being part of this uh, agenda of mobilizing enough revenue for this nation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to appreciate you, the media, for coming, but also our friends from CAFO. Is CAFO here? Yes, thank you for coming, and uh, of course, uh, we have the acting Commissioner General, James Sabola. So the next session, we're going to invite James Sabola to give away a few gifts. It's a culture within the Uganda Revenue Culture, organizational culture, to appreciate those that have done very well. And we'd like to appreciate the panelists and the moderator for today's session, our second Ibomba session. We still have three uh, Ibomba sessions every Friday, 10 to 12 p.m., 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll be live on Baba TV, live on BBS, live on URA TV, and other platforms. But also I want to remind you that we do a repeat of this show uh, every Tuesday from midday to 1 p.m. on NBS TV. And those particular stations, Frank, what we didn't mention, that Baba, BBS, and NBS are airing these shows for free. Let's appreciate them. They haven't charged the tax man because they know that uh, the money we have is for the taxpayer. And we appreciate them for that. Yes, James, over, over to you. Maybe you go to the platform there. We'll start with, uh, we'll start with uh, Shali Kongai. Thank you, Shali. And uh, for that reason, we have a certificate from the Commissioner General and a simple gift from us, a humble gift from us to appreciate your service today morning. Thank you. Next is uh, Judy. Uh, the, you are right, you're talking to the right person. Thank you, Judy. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Sudil. The color and size is because of uh, the gender. So we, this is for male. Female, they usually they prefer bright colors. So it's not really... Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Yes, Irene. Frank. Thank you, Frank. We appreciate your service. Now you can confirm that the color and size is for male. That's, uh, that's what I was talking about. The logo? James? Change the, this. No, this. The gift. The gift. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if uh, the Commissioner General has something to say. Okay, good. So we are headed for lunch, and you're invited for lunch. Thank you once again. We will be here uh, next uh, three Fridays, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., discussing uh, Ibombaya business and how do, we, uh, how do we partner with businesses to make sure that we position URA as a business enabler. Thank you very much. You're invited for lunch. Ask me for a group photo. Yes, up there. Hmm? Yeah.